Hello, shall we start? If you can take your seat. I think we need some uh, little bit more people, but we need to start because otherwise we'll be kicked out before we end. All right. So good morning, everybody. Look at this beautiful audience with a lot of people. It's very, very, very happy to see that. So welcome to today's EuroCities uh, event. From principle to action, how to implement the European pillar of social rights at local level. In short, if I may, cities get things done. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so who is organizing this event? Um, it's EuroCities, together with you know, uh, Maria Joao, who is uh, hosting us, who has allowed us. And I'm the Secretary General of EuroCities, so who, who are we? Uh, who, what is EuroCities? Uh, it's the alliance of the major cities of Europe that work together to improve the quality of life of people in urban areas. We network the local governments and the mayors, but also many deputy mayors, like today, of more than 140 big cities uh, and provide a platform for them to exchange between them, but also to work with the institutions and the European Union institutions towards a better recognition of the role of cities in EU policymaking. That's the who. Now, why? Why are we here? this morning and why it is important that we're all here today. We're here because we believe it's important to make this Europe more concrete, to show how we can get, uh, you know, how we can do things that matter to people and that respond to their needs. A Europe that doesn't leave people behind, that is inclusive, caring, fair. And that's why we are here today. We want to show that cities can contribute and do contribute to make the European pillar of social rights, more particularly, a reality on the ground. And therefore make this Europe relevant and a positive project yeah, for the future. So that's the why. <laughs> and the what? What are we going to do? It's, like, it's going to be, I believe, a, a unique opportunity for all of us and for you <coughs> Because we're going to be able to hear from, uh, from and of, because not everybody is there, over 20 cities that are across Europe that are pledging uh, to concretely act on the principles of the European pillar of social rights. It's unique. So you're going to have the opportunity to learn about these pledges, to hear about the commitment, and to enjoy as well some discussions with, you know, uh, between EU and EU institutions, representatives, partners, cities, and so on. So, it, you know, we look forward. So we're going to have a lot of important, interesting spe speakers on the menu. So I really invite you all to participate, to contribute in the limits of the available time, for sure, and to tweet. <laughs> the hashtag of the event is hashtag inclusive cities for all on the screen. And also, be informed that the event is uh, live streamed. I told my mom, so bye, hi, my mom. <laughs> okay, shall we start? We all ready? Are you all ready? Great, let's go. So to kick off, we have three important uh, speakers. Uh, they nearly don't need any introduction, I would say, but we have to do it anyway. <laughs> so Maria Joao. Rodriguez. You are the Vice President of the S&D Group in the European Parliament, but mainly the Rapporteur on the Pillar. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, this is important for us. You're a big friend of cities, of, uh, of Eurocities. It's been very positive to work with you and the team. Katarina Ivankovic. Is that Ivanovic. correctly? Ivankovic. <laughs> Ivankovic. Ivankovic. Thank you. You are the Director for Social uh, Affairs and DG Employment in the European Commission, so thank you for being with us and supporting also this event through our partnership yeah, in the framework of the EASY grant. Uh, welcome. And then Andrea, Andreas uh, Schoenström, you are the Vice Mayor of the City of Malmo and a fantastic Chair of EuroCity Social Forum. Well, thank you. <laughs> so thank you for being here from, uh, from Malmo. I know you, have, you will have to leave a little bit earlier today, but uh, thank you for being here. So, right, so may I ask, each of you to be as brief as possible in your uh, addresses because we have we are a bit late 10 minutes late so maria joao you are the first to have the floor mm -hmm. thank you very much you have to use the left um, okay, um well uh, good morning all of you uh, <laughs> this is really a great pleasure to receive you 
here in the House of European Democracy. And uh, the Parliament is there exactly to receive uh, actors, key actors as you are. And today's conference is so important because this is a big opportunity for us to discuss together how cities can bring about a Europe with more human face. And the social pillar is really about this. Why have we created the social pillar? Because we were feeling that something fundamental was missing in Europe. Uh, and we should have something strong to say, no, we want a Europe taking care of people, perceived as a Europe which protects people. And so we put together all the European institutions, all governments, all civil society, and we launched something big in Gothenburg with a big declaration. But I remember when we were there, we were saying, well, we want a declaration, but we want much more than a beautiful declaration. And then we start working intensively, and now I'm quite happy to tell you that yes, we are turning this declaration into a full toolbox of instruments you can use. Hmm? It's not only about uh, updating social standards with European law. Uh, we approved several important laws over the last months. Even last week, I vote an important law to improve working conditions and to have access uh, for social protection for all in all Europe. So this benefits of hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. This is powerful. But we are also adapting all our policies to push for the social pillar and most of all, all our financial instruments. So the message I'm bringing to you today is that now is up to cities to use the social pillar a toolbox with many possibilities and to invent the cities for this century. And yes, we know that cities are being deeply transformed. They will become uh, or should become low carbon, smarter, but it's very important that they are inclusive cities. They are perceived by cities as inclusive cities. And we know this is about housing, this is about access to education, to health, to social services, to culture. Mm -hmm. But it's up to you to invent these new cities. And that's why it's so important that the discussion is taking today place here, but also translated into your, your pledges. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious to, uh, to see which are these pledges. And, um, I'm at your disposal. The European Parliament is at your disposal. We involved hundreds of members of the European Parliament to prepare this, and they will be available to work with you. So many thanks again for, for coming, and uh, the best outcomes for this conference of today. Thank you, Maria Joao. Very inspiring. <laughs> really gives us the motivation to work together and invent, as you say, the city, the inclusive city of tomorrow. So thank you very much. Catalina, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you also, uh, Maria, for organizing uh, this uh, important conference. And I think it's coming at the right time to show how Pillar can deliver uh, indeed and how Pillar is important and I hope how Pillar will be important in the future. Uh, I would also like to thank the representatives of the Eurocities for organizing this conference. It's, it's a pleasure to work with you and it's a pleasure to see the commitment you have towards involving uh, more and more of your members to, to pledge for the, for the Pillar and uh, when my colleagues ask you, are those pledges just, you know, to declaration. declaration or just a piece of paper, I say no, because in each of the pledges you see the real activities, you see the real actions and you see the real funds supporting the actions and we know that uh, the goodwill is not enough. The goodwill needs to be followed with concrete actions and concrete resu results and uh, proposals and that is, I think, what your 
citizens and our citizens will value in the future and where they would be able really to say, okay, so my city did this based on the pillar and implemented in this way. So that is the importance of this conference. I think it's important to speak about it, to speak about it loud and really to be fully aware of where do we stand now. Uh, let me just remind all of us a little bit about the uh, importance of the pillar. Uh, the pillar is not uh, only the most important uh, piece of document for uh, DG employment and for especially for the directorate for social affairs, uh, uh, which I lead, but it is important for everybody. It is important for, for the parliament, for the commission, for the council, for the national uh, authorities for the uh, regional and local level and it's, it's, this is the way how it should be done with a lot of uh, horizontal, uh, a vertical approach but also horizontal approach and this, this is the way how do we make uh, the pillar reality. This is the way where the pillar will succeed, will stay alive, will become a main principle uh, for the actions in the future or not. And I think it's up to us and I think we know where we want to see and where we want to be. Uh, I would also like to emphasize that we saw the huge potential of cities to play uh, and the role of the cities within the implementation of pillar. When we look to the, to the pledges you made and when we look at the areas that you have selected, we can also say that we are quite, uh, quite happy because lots of activities and concrete activities has been done last year in the implementation of the pillar. So now we can speak directly as the work-life balance directive that covers several of, of uh, the pillar principles as the result of uh, one of the results of the pillar. So the work-life balance is targeting not only the gender equality, but also equal opportunities, employment challenges. It's, it's also for the first time touching, touching upon the caring responsibilities. Maria knows how difficult it was to get the carers leave as we have it now in the, in the work-life balance. At certain points, it seemed that it wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. I was frightened at that time, and uh, we shared some of the, those uh, frightening moments together in uh, last year, at the end of year, but then we managed to succeed and so for the first time in the EU uh, legislation you have the carer's leave and carer's leave then is closely linked to everything to the child care long-term care uh, health institutions health care uh, social uh, uh, institu different social institutions and these different social care facilities so in this respect it's really br bringing the different uh, principles of the pillar together we can also speak about the European Labour Authority as the concrete result of the, of the pillar. Uh, the discussion between the launching uh, of the, the initiative for the European Labour Authority and now when we have a political agreement, it has been in less than a year. So I really think we can speak about uh, speeding up the process and actually all of us in the Commission and the Parliament working fast on the, on the principles to be implemented working and pre uh, predictable and transparent working conditions. What, uh, what more do we want for our citizens but to know their employment rights, their labor rights from uh, the, the day that they enter the interview, I would say that they enter the employment services uh, in general and then conducting uh, the interviews and then having all the possibility of having all the information about their rights and, and uh, obligations as well. We also sometimes forgot, for, for example, the European Accessibility Act. It took 11 years to negotiate this important act. This act provides indeed uh, the right to the persons with disability to have, I, I, I always say, the next generation of rights. So it's not the accessibility to building, it, this is the accessibility of services. And all of us sometimes maybe forget about the importance of all of our citizens having the access to the services. So. Uh, I could also speak about the recommendation on social protection as the result uh, of the implementation of the pillar, which has the same access to all workers working in typical or atypical forms for the self-employed. And then we have to admit there is a lot to be done 
In this regard, there is a lot to be done on the implementation of the pillar. Also, a lot to be done uh, in the implementation of the uh, sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. And we did a little analysis in our units. And uh, if you look at the uh, sustainable development goals targets, and there are 169 targets, and two thirds of those targets couldn't be, can't be reached if we don't involve the regional level, if we don't involve you, the cities, in the implementation of those targets. So in this respect, I think it's, it's nevertheless more important to underline the importance of working together, working uh, together on the implementation of the pillar into our national, local, uh, and city strategies and action plans, and just keeping really the clear line where we want to be in the future, where we are now, what we want to see, and please always, always try to put the social agenda highly, highly on your list of priorities, because I think without the highly respected social agenda with clear actions, we will just be speaking in the declarations, but we will not be implementing them. So let's make the social agenda the reality. Thank you very much. And thank you for reminding how the pillar is just a sort of like trigger to connect to many other challenges and policies at all levels, yeah, from the local to the European. Now, I turn to Andreas. Um, you've heard, we've heard um, how both the European Parliament and the Commission recognize and have acknowledged the important, you know, the important role that cities can play in mm. pushing a fair European project. So what do you want to tell us today as an opening address? First of all, I, I want to, to tell, uh, tell you the, the most obvious thing, uh, that we already all realized how fantastic cities are and how fantastic this, uh, this part of the world that we all inherit are. The fantastic uh, diversity between our countries. I, uh, when we arrived last night, we, we talked in the taxi about uh, our experience of Brussels and how this city has developed uh, over the years. And I'm thinking about the rest of Europe and all the cities I have the privilege of visiting. Uh, seeing out in the audience today, I realize I have many friends here that I've seen your cities and we shared experiences from different European cities together. We have a huge diversity in our part of the world. We have a huge diversity between our cities, our countries, and uh, of course, our uh, citizens. But where there's one thing where we don't have diversity, and that's in our social challenges and problems. We are facing exactly the same problems all over Europe today and within our cities. There's no diversity in those. We all have problems with homelessness, educational systems that are failing, unemployment, and so on. I don't have to talk about all the problems. You know the problems. But we also know, as uh, mayors or vice mayors or politicians of our cities, we know that we share the everyday life of our citizens. We know the problems. We see them in time. And we are trying to st and struggle to do something about them. And we always end up, uh, when we meet in our conference and seminars discussing these problems, we always end up and perhaps sometimes saying some bad things about our national governments who don't give us the funds and means that, to solve the problems. Because we know what we would do if we had the funds. And this is really, I'm so proud to be here, representing a pledge of 21 cities uh, within your cities, saying we will invest 4.2 billion or 4.3 billion euros uh, in social welfare. We will invest in over 75,000 new houses uh, for our 20 million citizens living within our 21 cities. I'm so proud of that.
because this shows that we, we know what action we need to take and we are doing it. We are doing it many times, we are doing more, much more than we are legally binded to do because we are problem solvers and we need action. Um, and I want to use this opportunity to, as you recognize as members of parliament and in the commission, if we want action on the social pillar, if we want to close the gap between north and south, between east and west, within our very diverse European Union, we need the cities. The cities are the best tools to bring the European Union closer to its citizens. And let me finish by saying, uh, let this pledge from our 21 cities be the beginning of how we saw, show how the European Union can be in the future, how we can show our citizens that a European Union, uh, the European Union is not for the economy first, it's for its citizens first. And especially in this time where everyone is uh, looking at the debate in, in uh, the House of Commons in, in, in England or the UK, and we are looking how the response is from, from our governments and uh, the European Union. I think we are wasting too much time about discuss, discuss, discussing those who don't want to be a member. And we, use to, we, we need to use more of our time of discussing about those who are members, who want to be members, and all of those cities and citizens who want to, in action, show what the European Union can be. And I want to get, uh, as we said many times over from your cities, we want to have not be, be project owners, we want to be partners of uh, the ESF, or the other funds that are available for our citizens uh, and our cities. We want to be the partners of the Parliament and the European Co Commission in, in that sense that we are really changing the social pillar of being letters on a paper into a reality for our citizens. There's a Danish saying that goes like this. It says, where good people are, good people will come. And I think, let's show the, the House of Commons, but also let's show one each other what it really means to be a citizen of the, the European Union. If we do it well, if our citizens are doing well, when we close the gaps, when we are making all these pledges into real action, when the first family moves into that affordable housing, that was one of the pledges, when one migrant in Malmö learns to speak Swedish and get their first job uh, as a part of this pledge, uh, when a youngster find his first apartment or his first job, as a part of this pledge, we will show how good it can be and we can, we can show in real life that it really means something where good people are, good people will come and we will have shown the House of Commons what they are missing out on. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andreas, for being two things. On one side, very inspiring, but also very concrete. So thank you for these words. And you've opened uh, the dance for the next, uh, let's say, uh, session about the pledges and our initiative that we are taking the opportunity to launch today, which is inclusive uh, cities for all social rights in my city. Uh, which is exactly about real investment. So Andreas has told us uh, about your pledge, 
And now I would like to hear from those uh, other cities that are represented today. Uh, not all 21 could be here, uh, but a big uh, group has made it. Uh, about their pledges, if we can do that very, you know, how I think it, it will really show the impact of this uh, commitment and investment. So if we can go uh, in the order of the, let's say, the, the cities that have actually pledged, uh, starting by Madrid, for instance, Ramon uh, Palomino, Director for Employment and Social Policy. The idea is that each of you takes one minute to just say what is the pledge about, what is the commitment or the investment, and really one sentence about what does it mean to be an inclusive city today and having the social agenda high on your agenda. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm speaking on behalf of Madrid and excusing the presence of Marta Higueras, Deputy Mayor. I will say that Madrid pledged to meet Principle 4, active support to employment, and Principle 11, childcare and support to children. Every year, our city dedicates 20 million euros to reduce long-term unemployment and to reach 3,000 beneficiaries. And uh, we will also maintain investing 35 million euros per year to reach, by the end of this 2019, 69 infant schools from the current 56 and a total of 8,300 places for infants from zero to three years. Madrid aims to be an inclusive city that balances the districts and the citizens, starting with affordable childcare and education and not leaving behind those facing long-term unemployment. Thanks. Thank you very much. We were not, we're not going to uh, applaud everyone because otherwise we will spend it. But it's really, it's really amazing to see this kind of commitment. So uh, we're very proud as well to be a new citizen doing this. So Stuttgart, uh, Simon Fischer, Director for Muni of Municipal Service on Accessibility. There. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have to speak for uh, Werner Wölfle, Deputy Mayor for Social Affairs in Stuttgart. Stuttgart pledged um, to meet Principle 17 on the inclusion of people with disabilities. 44,000 people with several disabilities live in Stuttgart. In the last two years, we have invested over 3 million in suitable housing by year free mobility as well as participation in recreational sports, cultural and community activities for people with disabilities. We promise that further investments will follow. Accessibility and inclusion are very important for citizens' well-being. We believe a stronger social Europe aims to be an inclusive city that delivers barrier-free and self-determined access for all people equally, including people with disabilities. And to reach more people, we have translated our pledge into accessible language, especially for people with mental disabilities. Thank you very much. It's so good. Okay, now from Stuttgart to Gothenburg. Thank you. My name is Christina bergman alma um, in Gothenburg, we have chosen to strengthen our efforts and make a pledge based on principle one of the European Pillar of Social Rights. Uh, we make investments and we mobilize our work for equality through our initiative, Equal Gothenburg, which is basically a lifelong learning for all of our citizens uh, as the main priority. Uh, this priority is cross-sectoral. Uh, we start, and in, it involves librarians, all school levels, and our different systems for ed adult education. Uh, we provide early parental support to all families and early reading to ensure language development for all children. Uh, we call this initiative the city where we read to our children. Uh, to support families with instruments to stimulate reading and linguistic understanding, we also make certain that the next generation have a good reading comprehension, which is an important platform for democracy. Uh, for young people, we create uh, conditions to complete studies with a qualification, and for adults, we continue to ensure those conditions, uh, thus giving citizens a second chance. 
The idea is that no one should be left behind and that everyone wins on an equal and inclusive city. So, to summarise things, all citizens, no matter socio-economic background, are continuously provided with the opportunity to reach their full potential uh, and within the realms of the law, which is limited, but still, we also help those who are not citizens, and that is now definition to truly be an inclusive city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now a bit more to the south, Braga in Portugal, Firmino Marques, Deputy Mayor of Social Affairs. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for Braga to be here with my fellow colleagues all across Europe from City com Committed to re reinforce the role of uh, social rights. We believe a stronger social Europe is only possible fo by focusing on people, and I want to congratulate your city for this initiative. It's very important. The city of Prague makes the public commitment to principle 18 of the Europe, uh, European <coughs> pillar of uh, social rights. We give priority to the pre pre prevention and promotion of the social inclusion in long-term care, promoting the right to everyone to affordable long-term service of good quality. Braga pledged to spend in the next seven years about 1.5 million euros each year. This pledge serves to be continued some public programs we already have and create new, new one to provide care, assistance at home, leisure activity, and health care, for example. This pledge represents a total investment of 10.5 million euros only for social programs regarding the long term care. The expansion of our social programs is very important, and as our population are getting old, and uh, it's uh, fundamental to increase our social policies to cover all our senior population, promotion, home care and community-based service, developing and investing in innovative solution of real social impact, aiming social protection and inclusion. Thank you very much. And now a bit more notes. We move to Vienna. Uh, Michele Kauer, director of the Brussels office of Vienna. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to convey greetings of my city councillor responsible for housing and women. Good combination, by the way. Uh, Katrin Gas, she's sorry she cannot be here with us today. And we have uh, put forward a pledge on the gender equality issues. Um, to tell you that Vienna is a city where we believe in, in gender equality and overcoming the gender pay gap is vital for everybody, for the whole of our society. Uh, one aspect is when you're women, we always talk about money. Uh, our, the women's budget, the women's department's budget is 9 million euro per year, but the city's budget is 12 billion euro per, per year. So what we did is, of course, we said, okay, 9 million euro is a nice thing where you can do a lot of things, but you, of course, have to target the 12 billion uh, and make sure that this is money that is used for all the women in our city. What we do is we, do, we see we are a big buyer. We, we do a lot of public procurement that has rules now apply to empower women in business, in company. We do this in cooperation with the Chamber of Commerce and with, of course, the private sector, which is very important for us. Um, but this is all not enough to overcome the gender pay gap. Uh, this is why we are working very much on empowering young girls to take new roles, new paths, uh, leave stereotyped uh, uh, careers, and this is why we talk with them about sex, about how to be safe in the digital era, how to be, uh, uh, to how to do different things than, than has, like only being as, uh, working in, in an office or in, 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 in sales or, or being a secretary. Uh, so leave new, and we, we see that this is changing now. Uh, young girls are going more into natural sciences, are going more into uh, a technical um, employment. So the, there we see a development which is very good. Thank you. 
more engineers, <laughs> women. <laughs> okay, Laia from uh, <coughs> Barcelona, former chair also of our uh, staff. Good morning. Uh, in fact, the city of Barcelona is presenting today two, two pledges, one of principle 14 about minimum income and on principle 19 about housing and homelessness. We firmly believe that in redistribution of wealth through tax policy, but also uh, direct aids. So we, we provide tools uh, with a minimum income to 1,000 families to provide them with some stability, the possibility to pay the bills that can allow them to think and build beyond the emergency situation of their every, everyday lives. And also we want with these projects to, to give evidence to the European Union and also to the, to the states that, uh, that the ones that should be responsible for the minimum incomes, that these policies really, really work. What are we doing? On the minimum income, Barcelona is committed to invest 17 million, co-founded with the urban innovative actions from the EU. We invest also 150 million from the municipal budget to implement the Barcelona Neighborhoods Plan, just to reduce inequalities between neighborhoods. We also leading the uh, urban inclusion network with other uh, nine European cities to co-create social policies fighting, fighting poverty. But in the second place, one of our priorities is housing, affordable housing. Um, the lack of affordable housing is triggering across European cities, gentrification, poverty, residential exclusion, and homelessness. Barcelona has put this priority because the 80% of the poverty in the city is related to non, non, non having affordable housing. So with this pledge on housing and homelessness, we are committed uh, to, invest, to invest in 182.5 million each year, enlarging the stock on affordable housing with additional 5,000 housing units, also shifting the model from property to rental, and also direct support for rental to 9,000 beneficiaries in, in 2019, and also to support for renovations to over 10,000 um, beneficiaries in, in 2019. Also, in, in homeless, we invest 35 million per, per year, not only with new shelters, for example, for uh, young people, that is a new phenomenon that is in, increasing, but also in labor inclusion programs, creating additional um, uh, housing first uh, units, and also to increase for outreach teams to provide social support to, to homeless people. So please, we need the, the support from the, the commission because all the cities are really committed with the, with the social pillar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Talking about housing, just to remind, half of our pledges received are concerning housing, like affordable housing and homelessness. Okay, Timi Shuara, Imre Farkas. Thank you. Um, we have around uh, 52,000 children, uh, and the municipal municipality is aware of his key role in ensuring access to childcare, education, and social services for them. That's why Timi Shuara pledged to meet Principle 11 on childcare and support to children. Also in Timisoara live around 40, 70,000 elderly, representing over 15% of uh, Timisoara's population. So principle 18 on long-term care is important for us. Timisoara is the largest and the most developed city in west of Romania. Like other social economically developed cities in EU, Timisoara is facing a large number of homeless people and growing need for social housing. So we make a commitment to Principle 19 on housing and assistance for homeless. In the context of uh, designating Timisoara as one of the European Capital of Culture 2021, I think it's very important to revive and present the multicultural heritage of our city to bring to light the specifics of Timisoara, which is given precisely by the coexistence of different ethnic groups and their contribution to its development culture and social affairs coexist. They are linked together. So our city will invest over 3 million euros each year for social services for children, elderly and homeless. It will also implement projects with an estimated value of 8 million euros to improve social infrastructure and services for children and families, especially for disadvantaged area, to improve care services for elderly and to increase accommodation capacity for homeless. Thank you very much.
<clears throat> so the millions are going up. <laughs> uh, Abbasi Akem, Deputy Mayor for Social Affairs of Nantes. Thank you and, and uh, good morning. Nantes uh, pledges to implant implant meant <laughs> principle uh, 19 because access to housing is a fundamental human right and because without a roof human beings have no dignity for us the city uh, has the duty to answer different needs in different <coughs> ways and for different populations because today we are faced faced with complex situations, both individually and collectively. I will give you just one concrete example in the fight against homelessness. The city of Nantes set up a construction project in social housing called IGLU. IGLU is a specific construction project whereby vulnerable people take part in the construction of their home and at the same time enjoy training uh, provided by professionals to facilitate their social and professional integration. This small scale IGLU construction project, uh, six homes per project, illustrates uh, how the most vulnerable of our citizens can successfully become actors of their own records, records traction. But today, to win the battle of social and professional inclusion, we need all three levels, European, central government, and city, to act <coughs> together on social Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thomas Fabian from Leipzig, Deputy Mayor. Can I ask you to be much briefer? Because otherwise we won't be able to finish. We are already 20 minutes late. Well, because the pledges are all described here huh, in detail. So just say your pledge and the commitment. Okay, Anna. I will be very brief. The city of Leip oh, sorry. Okay, Anna, I will be very brief. The city of Leipzig has committed itself, like many others, to the Principle 19, Housing and Assistance for the Homelessness. We have in Leipzig a very comprehensive concept which ranges from, ranges from the prevention of homelessness to helping poor people finding houses, providing um, uh, housing for refugees uh, to shelter for homeless people uh, and um, immediate help for people on the street. We will raise our expenditures up to 10 million annually um, in the next years. Uh, we will expand our services and adapt them to new needs. We believe that social policy in Europe has to protect the most vulnerable. Thank you. Perfect. So the deputy mayor of uh, Warsaw, can you follow the example of Thomas? And <laughs> yes, I will, I will try to be very, very quick. Uh, our pledge is about principle 11. Uh, child care and support for children. Warsaw is uh, a city of the tremendous economic growth. We also have a very good demographic growth, which is a very good news. But that also means that we need a strong and real actions to support families with small children. And to do so, starting from December this year, all children in Warsaw will benefit from free of charge uh, crash care. That means that they will pay zero. They will be for free for the parents. If no place can be found in the public crèche, the city will pay for carrying a private one, which is very important. We will also uh, build at least 36, 36 new uh, nurseries for 5,000 children till 2023. And we also like to stimulate private sector to see uh, 6,000 places in the private sector. That means that more than 66% of Warsaw children will benefit from uh, crash care and 50% of that will be totally free. The total cost of uh, the project will be around uh, 340 million euros. This is a very ambitious goal, but that it must be ambitious to... to, yeah, to, to Exactly, but that's how we see uh, our goals and that's how we would like improve the quality of life in, in Warsaw for, for our citizens. Thank well, you. Thank you.
very nice. Thank you very much. And we're left with three. So Athens, Utrecht, and Tampere. Athens, Elefteris is there. Be brief, because you will be part of the panel, too. And the same thing for Martin. Yes, thank you. Uh, Athens is committed to principle one, the right to education, uh, basis for democracy. And principle three, equal opportunity is a principle umbrella that can cover many, many different policies. And we in Athens, coming from a country and a city that faces a real economic crisis, we believe that when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Thank you. I'm sorry to rush this through. It's, it's, it's a horrible role I play, but Utrecht, Martin van Eugen. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll keep it brief as well. But still, a few things. Uh, we are pledging for principle number 19. It's about homeless people. Is it working? And I would like to say the reason is very simple, because we cannot accept people living on the streets, but moreover, we cannot accept people living without any perspective. So... We have a small, short really video short. about it, yeah. exactly. Hoi, welkom bij mijn vlog. Ik ben Maarten, ik ben wethouder in de prachtige stad Utrecht. En vandaag neem ik je mee in deze vlog naar allerlei plekken voor dakloze mensen, dakloze Utrechters. En dit is de eerste plek die ik je wil laten zien, namelijk de nieuwe inloop en ook wat slaapplekken hierboven. Aan de nieuwe gracht. Want we willen dat daklozen niet meer overleven, maar gewoon een normaal leven gaan doen. Ik sta hier naast Ferdinand. Hier hebben we Ferdinand. Ferdinand weet alles van deze locatie. En wat is er nou zo bijzonder aan deze locatie? Hier is een inloop, die is zeven dagen per week open. Maar er is niet alleen een inloop hier, je hebt hier ook meteen de hoek verleden. Dat we echt weer de stap terug kunnen zetten naar het gewone leven. Dus denk aan. Uh, werk, natuurlijk gewoon ook een normaal plekje waar je kan slapen. Niemand... Waarom is dat? Waarom kan je hier ook slapen? Iemand die hier binnenkomt en die is dakloos. En uh, iemand in de inloop die maakt het eerste gesprekje. Dan kan iemand uh, vanuit de stad zien herstellen, iemand plaatsen van bed. Dat is echt helemaal nieuw. Kijk, en hier staan we voor misschien wel de bekendste plek van uh, de dakloze opvang. Namelijk de nachtopvang, de sleep in. We gaan hier van de nachtopvang ook een opvang opmaken waar je uh, overdag kan zijn. Wordt dus ook uh, verbouwd en in plaats van alleen maar slaapzalen willen we dat mensen gaan leven in plaats van overleven uh, en daarna in plaats van een slaapzaal een eigen plek, een eigen kamer. Of deze plek dus hier, die is ook van de tussenvoorziening. Uh, de stek heet deze plek. We gaan ook even niet naar binnen. Zo zeer privacygevoelig kan je iets bij voorstellen, denk ik. Uh, maar dat is een plek uh, waar ook uh, met name zwaar alcohol en zwaar drugsverslaafde mensen verblijven. Het, het is wel gaaf. Zo midden in het centrum. Ik vind ook dat het daar hoort. Niet weggedrukt in het centrum. Thank you. And last but not least, Joanna uh, Lucas Corpi from Tampere, who is about to approve the pledge, right? Yes, thank you. Good morning. The city of Tampere welcomes the Eurocity's timely initiative on European Pillar of Social Rights and is very happy to join the campaign. Our pledge will be focusing on social protection and participation. In Finland, we already have a strong legislation on different social aspects such as equality, rights of disabled people, early childhood and basic education, elderly care and subsistence, including participating and using co-creation with the citizens in planning, developing and purchasing different services is an important value for the city of Tampere. Tampere is also the first city in Finland which has accepted program against poverty in city council. These are the themes we wish to further enhance through joining the Bletz later this spring. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you've heard all these pledges. We have more, uh, another eight cities, Turku, Ljubljana, Leeds, Ghent, Glasgow, Milan, Lille, Lyon, who are also uh, pledging but couldn't be with us. So, you know, with a very big uh, impact in terms of billions uh, and investments and work for people. So across Europe, also if you see in the 
Can I, can I steal you this? You, if you can see that, that's quite powerful. And the, the map is also showing how you know, well spread the, the pledges are in a representative way, in a way, in all, in all countries. So that, that we're very happy about that. And we'll continue. So well done, guys. Well done. Thank you very much. A big hand for our cities. And now I'd like to invite you just down here, the cities, uh, and um, invite Katerina and uh, Maria Joao to, uh, Joao to um, come too, so that we can give you formally the pledges. Just two minutes, don't go away. <laughs> Just a, for a photo, for a family photo. May I invite the panelists of the first uh, debate to join me here? You'll see your name on the top. So Lefteris is there, Martin, Jan, Christina. Uh, Mr. Svark, there, Svark, Ewalis, great. So, back on track after the photo, a little bit of a, it feels like a tracking rather than a conference, <laughs> but it's okay, it's good, it keeps us uh, alive. So, welcome to our first panel debate on how to ensure equal opportunities with active support to employment for all people, including migrants and refugees. So, our recent report that you find uh, at the entrance and you have in, in, your, in your bag uh, looks into how cities deliver equal opportunities and access to employment. Now, the findings 
show that the diversity of backgrounds and in, in cities is actually uh, increasing and that the groups that are most at risk uh, in terms of discrimination and exclusion from the labor market are exactly ethnic minority and, and, uh, and, uh, and migrants. So that's why we decided to dedicate more time to this, uh, to this issue and to this theme. So we have a super panel here, quite big, Lefteris, Martin, Christina, we've heard already uh, your pledges, Jan Olbricht, uh, Ergi Schwark, and uh, Wallis Gole. So, Let's go through. <laughs> let's, go, let's start from the cities. Lefteris, uh, Papagiani, Papagianakis, is that right? You are the vice mayor of Athens in charge of social integration. Um, you are also chairing the Eurocities working group on migration and integration. Can you tell us about, uh, can you tell us briefly about how cities are ensuring equal opportunities uh, for migrants? And also, just to stay in the same uh, thing and using Eurocities, have you been inspired by some practices in other cities that you brought uh, to Athens, for instance? Thank you. Yes. Um, many cities have competencies to implement policies. Many cities create competencies and innovation, such as Athens. Um, and we have been able to, uh, through innovation, uh, ensure the access uh, of everyone to social services. And what, that was a big goal of the city of Athens. I have to remind you that we are facing a real crisis and not a fake one. Uh, we didn't have the capacity or the competency or the experience to do it. Mm -hmm. So through the work of Eurocities, uh, and especially with the cities that are present, amongst others, Utrecht, Madrid, Barcelona, and many others, uh, we took ideas that are implemented in those cities and we transposed them to Athens. Although, again, I have to repeat, it's not our competency to do so. Yeah. So through uh, the political will, that is one of the key elements yeah. uh, for policy implementation of the mayor, uh, we are able to offer equal access to everyone. Um, as you know, we have many issues, all of the cities also, with very specific questions such as undocumented, etc., etc. But yeah. I think that uh, those, these issues will, be, will come, be coming up in the years to come mm. and we will have to find answers to that also. Yeah. Uh, on that note, I have to remind you that Athens is one of the beneficiaries of the UIA project, mm. uh, as is Utrecht. And we have been awarded the European Capital of Innovation yeah. Award for 2018 amongst others for the work that we do for social integration and migrants and refugees. Great. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And now another perspective in terms of north-south. It's also <laughs> interesting in that respect. Martin, you are the vice mayor of Utrecht and vice chair of the Eurocities Social Affairs Forum. Your cities, like uh, Athens as well, has piloted an urban innovative action. It's called Plan yeah. Einstein. It's incredibly interesting. I've been there. It's a great project. What are the key lessons that you can share uh, with us uh, from this experience and how, how important it's been to, it's been to have a, an EU funding like the Innovative Actions uh, to help you to do something innovative like that? Yeah, yeah thanks a lot. Um, indeed, we got uh, the finance uh, from UEI for the Plan Einstein project and the Plan Einstein project is, is I think, a very innovative project about how we... Uh, 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 shelter uh, people, uh, asylum seekers, because when we uh, planned to, uh, to build a new asylum center, um, then the neighborhood was very angry because uh, we, the people uh, here in the neighborhood can't uh, uh, build affordable housing. We don't, you don't have affordable housing for them, but now you're building uh, uh, houses for uh, uh, asylum seekers. So I think uh, for all of you, uh, um, um, more people here in this room, uh, uh, it's a, a recognition, I think, because we all have these same problems. And then we started with a new innovation product because we said, okay, what if we build a, a shelter that is not only for uh, asylum seekers but also for youngsters in, uh, in the neighborhood? So we do it together. And we don't only build an asylum center, but can we make it a neighborhood center with all kind of uh, facilities uh, uh, that is... Uh, uh, Lots more than just people living there uh, by night and sleeping there with uh, a roof on their head. Uh, so that's what we started to do, and then indeed we got finance to uh, to build this from uh, from UEI. Um, and now uh, th there was a lot of anger, uh, uh, but now we are a few years uh, further. We did a research about how 
people in the neighbourhood are uh, uh, looking forward to this uh, uh, project, and people are enormous enthusiastic about it because they said this is uh, what we needed in this neighborhood this is exactly uh, what was needed to build this uh, uh, further so even uh, the biggest uh, uh, um, uh, uh, anti-people in the neighborhood are now the, the biggest pro-people uh, for this uh, project so we, we build a huge shift in this project and I think uh, there are uh, lots of lessons for this not only for the city of Utrecht but uh, moreover, because now uh, also the House of Representatives, the Tweede Kamer in the Netherlands, they said uh, uh, this should be the norm for uh, lots of more uh, uh, asylum centers all over the Netherlands. So I think we built something very innovative. I hope it uh, will uh, flow all over the country and maybe all over Europe as well. Yeah. Okay, so from Athens we've heard political will, creativity, learning from other cities, innovation from Utrecht, all these are uh, ingredients to really solve challenges in very difficult environments and with hard challenges. So we move to uh, Gothenburg. As we've heard from you, Christina, you are the vice chair of the City Political Committee on Social Welfare in, uh, in the city. So you have a strategy that is called uh, Equal Gothenburg. Yeah, you mentioned it. This is a strong strategy that also goes um, you know, beyond the political changes, it's quite, yes. uh, it's quite strong, so it's, it's something that is not linked to a specific program or party, it's very embedded in the DNA, yeah, the po political and policy DNA of the city, if, uh, if I may say. So how do, you, how do you, can you tell us about that? It's quite an interesting uh, approach. Uh, well, one can say that, first of all, we're a city of 500,000 inhabitants, so it's Maybe in a European perspective, a rather small city, but in a Swedish perspective, we are the second largest city. Uh, we're the only city in our region that, that reaches that, that size. Um, and despite only 500,000 people, there's a difference in 12 years of the expected life expectancy of, of different people within the city. So, of course, we realize that it can't be, if you live in one area, you're expected to live 12 years longer than if you live somewhere else. So of course we have to do something. And you say embedded in the DNA. Well, perhaps we're not there yet. Yeah, but, uh, but I think that in Sweden we've worked with sort of the idea of having a social welfare state far, far longer than, than many of the other uh, cities and, and uh, uh, countries in Europe. So I think that that gave a good basis. Uh, but for us it's, it's really important that we make certain that we look upon the needs of all people and, and to make certain that all people have the possibility to, to reach their goals. And that's one of the reasons why we started with the city where we read to our children, because it's, mm. it gives so much. I mean, just imagine the fact that you don't, if you don't have a language, how can you express yourself? How can you talk about your feelings? How can you see and read about the dreams that you might have? Uh, and of course, also in a time like this, with the upcoming election of the European Union, it is important to have a critical mind as well concerning what you read. So I, I think it's really, really the core is, is this sort of making everyone have the opportunity to have uh, a chance to, to create their own lives. And it's, just, it's not just one chance, you have to continuously give people a chance because you might not find the right track straight away. Right. Thank you very much. It also shows how the territorial aspect is important because oh, yes. you're looking at the neighborhood and uh, not only the general strategy, but looking at the, like cohesion policy does, for instance, mm -hmm. but a sort of social cohesion. Okay, so now from the city level, we move to the <coughs> EU level. We can start with Jan, Jan Olbricht. You are many things. You are the president of the Intergroup for Urban Affairs. You are the co-rapporteur for the MFF. You are rapporteur for the ERDF opinion of the Regi Committee. You have, anyway, you know many things about cohesion of today, yesterday, tomorrow. What can you tell us about, for instance, the, for the next period and the proposals we have seen on the table um, on yeah, cohesion post-2020? What about this integration of ERDF and ESF? Because that allows CCs to have an, uh, an integrated approach on things, yeah? And what can you tell? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation. And uh, I think it's, it's really a very clear proof, that this kind of meeting, that uh, 
uh, that either we speak on a very general level or we are very concrete. And I think this is, this is kind of unique shows that when you speak to the cities, it's very concrete and very pragmatic. So I think it can change really the, the European, European world. This is first. Second, uh, I represent the uh, so-called urban intergroup, which is uh, trying to, to show the importance of the cities in European policies. But before answering your question, I say, but we shouldn't forget, well, especially when you speak about social problems, migration, etc., that between, between the European level and the city level, there are governments. And I think we shouldn't forget it. That the, the, this is very important. What, what are the policies of the government concerning the social policy, concerning the immigration, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? We, can, we cannot forget it, because we cannot expect that the, the cities they will do it themselves, or they can have the direct contact with the U, U, European level without the contact with the governments. So I'm from Poland, and the mayor of Warsaw is here. We know very well what we are talking about about the immigration, etc. So this is the this is the real problem. So that's why when we are fighting our, our European level on the uh, for the for the uh, cities' importance is just to say European Union should have a very clear urban policy, and the urban policy of European Union, which will be trans transferred through the governments next to the cities. But if we don't have the urban policy, it just just creates some kind of good regulations, and next it will be up to the governments to do it. And we will have better government of the world. It depends on the situation. And then let's be concrete. To the, the city level is, in fact, the best level to make integrated approach. If not, integrated approach is pure theory. It's just slogan. And we repeat integrated approach. Integrated approach is completely no consequences at all. It's one of the very, pro, very European slogan, which doesn't mean anything. Cities level is, is practical. Why? Because in the cities we have to do it. You have no choice. You have to do it. When you speak about the concrete social problems and speak about the, the different ideas, this is very concrete because it's integrated by definition. On the city level, everything is integrated by definition. You cannot separate it. And now going to your idea of the ESF. Yeah. I must be critical. Because I think that still, this is the, we are living in the, in the world of administrations, different administrations, and we are still living in the, in the world of different silos, the, uh, on the European level as well. For many, many years, we were doing everything to have the cross-financing between ERDF and ESF. <coughs> I was very, very uh, 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 grateful for you that you were not speaking all of you about money, you are speaking about the ideas. Because on the city's level, you, you first you have to do something, and next you are trying to find money. Very often you say, you have money, I don't know what to do with the money. But the, the question is, what should be done? Integrated approach in the RDF ESF is absolutely crucial. Because if not, we will have two separate elements, and the question is on which level will be integrated? On which level? It should be very clear to the final beneficiaries to, to go and say, I need money for this and that. And not, I go to this administration or this administration. When we look at the, uh, what we are now preparing for the next period, you, you will look at the ERDF, and you have the text which is very clear, which is, for example, I quote, this is the, one of the main priorities, is improving access to inclusive and quality services in education, etc., enhancing effect, etc. This is number four. The number four is not in priorities. This is not priority. The priority is completely different. When we have the, for example, in the big cities, some of them are from big cities, there will be two priorities which are the most important. I mean, this is about the IT and the climate. And the social is not in the priorities. We are fighting to make it more flexible because everything depends on the situation in the cities. It cannot be decided uh, somewhere. It should be concrete on, on, because that's why I don't, I don't see any reason why the, this priority is not in priorities, for example, in the big cities. So big cities will have 85% for two, and the rest, <coughs> it will be in the rest. So this is, I think, but this is much more complicated inside the Commission. It's just not to go to DG Regio and DG Employment. This is the whole philosophy of, 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 of the problem in, inside the European Union. We are trying to, we will, we will not have a clear uh, link between the RDF and the ESF. We will have the chance to transfer 5% from one fund to another fund. But we need absolutely the integrated element. We need the, the for example, one investment, we will have the social side and the investment side together. It should be as simple as possible. 
Simplification is not to make two simple administrations. The simplification means make it one and make it simple for the final beneficiaries. So I think that many people in the European Commission share this view. But this is much more complicated, as you know, because you know how administration works. Administration is defending their own fields. I mean, the social field is defending the social field. The investment field is defending the investment field. We are trying to, to, to find a way to, to, to oblige the, to work together. And just to answer your question, we, are, uh, we hope that we will have several months ahead of us, and it will be as simple as possible, and it will be integrated. And then the not very good news is that the final result of the new MFF will be probably half of 2020, at, uh, at the earliest, 20, half of 2020. Don't be surprised. I'm the, I am the rapporteur on, the, on, be, on behalf of the parliament. So I, I can tell you that before March, April 2020, there will be no, there will be no uh, agreement. I'm all, absolutely almost sure, because in, in the, the end of the year will be the European Council, next will be the, the Council, next will be the uh, Parliament, next will be the decision, next will be sectorial regulations which will be accepted. Half of 2020, uh, so be prepared, be prepared for this, because everything we say that we should as soon as possible means more or less this time. Thank you. Okay, so a wake-up call <laughs> on the... On the challenges ahead in terms of uh, yeah, the next multi-financial uh, you know, framework that we have, also cohesion policy as a policy that is probably the last one left that is really having a territorial approach as a policy and not only as a, as a fund. And in there, how can we maintain this integrated approach? Uh, how can we make the, inter, you know, the integrated territorial investment instruments like you know, uh, concrete things that can really actually work on the ground? So still, having said all that, cities need to, you know, to have it easy. They have to be able to combine, have uh, not too many different managing authorities to do things because they get things done. So if we, if the European Union, the member states can help in doing that, in not only simplifying but also allowing this better integration of funds is really an important thing for cities. Okay, um, so thank you, Jan, for this uh, wake-up call. <laughs> and now to the European Commission, DG Employment, um, Ergi Schwark, if I pronounce correct. You are the head of unit in DG Employment in charge of social investment. Now, how can or does the European, Uni uh, the European Commission work uh, closely and closer to the cities to ensure equal opportunities, uh, especially for refugees and migrants, uh, so that they can better access then the labour market. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for the floor. And also, can thank you. you. Sorry, can you use the left mic? Because otherwise on the web streaming you won't be seen. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the floor and also thanks to Jan Olbrecht for raising the issue of uh, interlinkages and complementarity uh, between uh, different funds. Uh, I think that there is a good example of um, uh, the Commission's strive to uh, work in that direction here because we're sitting here together with my uh, colleague from, uh, from DG Regio and uh, we are uh, trying on an everyday basis to work together to make sure that the uh, integration of uh, the funding opportunities uh, actually is translated then into uh, actions uh, from uh, which the beneficiaries can uh, can benefit it, and I subscribe to the to, to your point that it is not easy but uh, 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 I think that the, the, the will and determination also on the Commission side uh, side is there and we have uh, high expectations from the regulatory framework from the next uh, MFF uh, to support uh, this process process or to, to move as far as possible in this uh, uh, direction. Um, coming back to uh, the sort of topic of, of, uh, of, the, um, of the panel, uh, there are also high expectations from the implementation of the pillar. Um, I wanted to draw um, uh, the attention to the uh, pillar principle 14, which is uh, maybe unfortunately uh, called minimum income. Uh, uh, and 
because it is important for, for everybody to understand that this, this pillar principle is not only about providing financial support to uh, those uh, in need, uh, but it specifically um, talks about integration of uh, services, social services, and activation em uh, employment measures. And this is uh, uh, this integrated approach, which was already uh, mentioned before, is um, uh, at the core of what we uh, would like to achieve uh, uh, when we talk about um, uh, vulnerable groups, be it uh, uh, migrants or people with migrant background or people uh, with uh, uh, different um, disabilities or people in vulnerable uh, situations. Um, so this integration of these three strands, uh, um, uh, financial, social uh, services, <coughs> and uh, employment activation is, uh, is uh, at the core. Um, I'm, I'm glad that the, the representative from, from Athens is here because uh, um, uh, I also uh, worked with, uh, with Greece for, for, uh, for some time and I witnessed the, the introduction of uh, 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 the national scheme for uh, guaranteed minimum income, which is precisely um, uh, the scheme that tries to bring these three elements uh, together uh, and um, uh, I think that we can congratulate especially the Athens uh, municipality because uh, the Athens social services uh, uh, department is really strong and um, uh, we have been cooperating with them. Uh, they are also implementing one of uh, our uh, social innovation projects successfully, um, uh, which had, uh, uh, I think, conference last week, if I if I recall well. Um, so this is this is a good example of the uh, of the integrated approach. Um, on the on the policy front, um, uh, I think. For the, for the Commission, what, what is also important to uh, make sure that there is this connection between the policy, government, and uh, uh, implementation level. Uh, and this is what we try to do via uh, uh, our analysis in the country reports and our country-specific recommendations. And this is where we also try to um, uh, mainstream the, the the implementation of the uh, of the uh, pillar. Uh, the pillar the pillar language is um, more and more present in the um, uh, European semester uh, in our uh, country specific recommendations for different countries, uh, and we uh, will continue in that uh, in the direction. Uh, to make sure that the, the uh, uh, implementation or the, 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 the guidance to, to implement the pillar um, continues from, uh, from our side. Um, as I mentioned, we also involved in the policy experimentation, social innovation, uh, also in terms of uh, migrant integration. Uh, we are financing few pilot uh, projects in that area, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, the, uh, the feedback we get from all fronts is uh, there has to be uh, individualized, personalized, integrated approach, which is basically certainly no surprise to, uh, uh, to you as uh, representatives of, uh, of, the, of the cities. Um, on the <clears throat> financing front, that was already uh, mentioned, um, uh, our proposal for the European Social Fund uh, intends to ring fence 25 percent of uh, the uh, social fund resources for uh, uh, fighting poverty and uh, and exclusion and this is also the the envelope from which uh, uh, we would expect that the migrant integration uh, could be uh, could be tackled um, again obviously in uh, uh, in uh, uh, conjunction with the with the other funding instruments, I uh, think we should also um, uh, talk about or, or bring to your attention uh, the Invest EU uh, uh, program, which is um, uh, uh, continuation, uh, but not only continuation; it's a bit of a revamp of uh, the current uh, FC, um, uh, the Juncker Plan. It's sometimes referred to. Um, 
uh, and it offers also a dedicated um, uh, social window uh, where we will uh, strive to support the uh, investment in social infrastructure and uh, obviously uh, such investments will have to happen uh, in uh, uh, places where uh, you also come from and we hope that this uh, may be one of the streams to support your uh, pledges. Um, okay, so I think that's um, that's all, and, and uh, f from my from my part. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you for this perspective. Uh, let's say DG employment perspective and uh, complementary, uh, possibly to the DG Regio perspective. So, Walis, you are a good friend of the Urban Agenda, for instance, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about. Uh, the urban uh, partnership on inclusion which is one of the most successful ones uh, within the urban agenda framework uh, how you know what to expect for the next uh, period could we continue get some support for that how how do you see things thank you very much Annalisa. good morning to all colleagues in the room it's a pleasure to be with you again first of all i would like to say that from the perspective of dg uh, regio the European pillar of social rights is indeed very important and it is above all a unique opportunity to promote what we call in our jargon upwards social convergence. And that is one of the key reasons why the pillar was established. I've been working for 15 years in uh, DG employment together with ERG, so you may remember that this was one of our key uh, objectives. Among uh, the principles of the, the pillar, which I extremely well summarized in this little leaflet, we have in particular principle number three about equal opportunities. And cohesion policy as such is a very important tool to meet the equal opportunity principles of the European pillar of social rights. And in particular, when it comes to social integration, access to the labor market, and in other words, I would dare to say, when it comes to inclusive growth, and I, Rafa, which I am responsible for in DG uh, Regio. So first of all, I'd like to make some comments when it comes to uh, the post-2020 um, programming uh, period. We have, first of all, as Commission, made the so-called MFF proposals for the seven years budget between 21 and 2017. And this proposal indeed reflects uh, the challenges and the priorities which have been outlined in the European Pillar of Social Rights, as well as those which have been outlined in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And as Annalisa or someone else uh, from one of the cities reminded it, uh, cities are extremely important uh, players when it comes to implementing the SDGs, as something like 64 or 67% of them are completely dependent upon action from cities themselves. The next MFF itself places indeed the European pillar of social rights at its very core. And it has established for doing so a dedicated cluster, I quote, investing in people, social cohesion and values. So this is something which I wanted to highlight. Now, the title of your session is From Principle to Action. And to illustrate that title, I would like to say that moving from the MFF, to the legislative package for cohesion policy in the next programming period, we have the so-called common provision regulations, which define the rules for EU funds operating under what we call shared management. So where the member states, the regions, have responsibilities for implementation. And under the new CPR, common provision rules regulation, we have two very important objectives which are relevant for our topic today. First of all, policy objective four, a more social Europe. And secondly, policy objective five, which is directly relevant for cities, which is all about Europe getting closer to its citizens. And under policy objective five, we have in particular specific objective one, which is all about sustainable urban development. And in this respect, echoing the remarks from uh, Ian Albright, I would like to say that under policy objective five, as well as under policy objective four, by the way, we can invest together, the European Social Fund Plus and ERDF, the European Regional Development Fund, in order to move towards integrated approaches in the field of equal opportunity and social inclusion. And this is even more important when it comes to cities, 
because the CPR provides for what we call a minimum requirement. So it's a legal obligation that cities, in order to benefit from ARDF funding, put in place, it's a prerequisite, sustainable integrated development strategies. This is something which is absolutely important. And the second minimum requirement is that these strategies are being developed together with the support of the citizens represented by the corresponding stakeholders. But there, once more, ERDF and ESF Plus will have the possibilities to work together and to invest together. So, altogether for the post-2020 period, and in a nutshell, I would tend to consider that priorities such as investing in people and social infrastructure, ESF Plus, ERDF, have been made more visible, and a critical amount of funding has actually been allocated to them. And the proof of that, the evidence, thanks God, is that cohesion policy maintained the largest share of the MFF. Cohesion policy is becoming the most important investment policy of the European uh, Union, now even before the common agricultural policy. <coughs> now, when it comes to ERDF in particular, the European Regional Development Fund, we support their social infrastructure development, and not as we do under ESF+, Plus, have been responsible for it as well, target groups as such. So therefore, we have to work indeed very closely uh, together. And we are with the European Regional Development Fund supporting infrastructure, equipment and services when it comes to education and training, childcare facilities, social inclusion, health, housing, community-based services, independent living for people with disabilities, all sorts of investments which contribute to social integration as well as to the modernization and transformation of public services and in particular social services. Moreover, and this is something on which I am particularly keen on providing you with some ideas, I believe it is also very important now to think in terms of territorial cohesion to think in terms of territorial inequalities, because very often I see a correlation between territorial inequalities and social inequalities. At the end of the day, all of us as individuals, we are place-based, we live somewhere. And according to the place we live, we may or may not have equal access to a range of public services and so forth. And on this front, the European Regional Development Fund has to play a specific role, and we intend indeed to play it in the next programming period, as we are already doing it now, when it comes in particular to the regeneration of deprived urban and rural areas, action to reduce spatial and educational isolation of marginalized groups, business startup benefiting directly marginalized communities, and supporting their long-term economic and integration in particular also when it comes to migrants. Now, in terms of money, because money is very important, the current ERDF allocation which goes to inclusive growth priorities, such as employment, social inclusion, education, do you know to which amount it equals to? No one in the room? Okay. 21.4 billion euros. 21.4 <coughs> billion euros of the ERDF in the current programming period, 1420, actually goes directly to supporting the European pillar of social rights. So. Now, beyond investment considerations, we are also in DG Regio, and I was personally in charge of it, responsible for a number of strategic initiatives which have been recently launched and have been launched by the member states, and there I'm talking about the urban agenda for the European Union for better knowledge, better regulation and better exchange, uh, better knowledge, better regulation and better funding. And there I would like to echo as well what Jan has been suggesting, that we put in place an urban policy at EU level. For the moment, I do not see any legal base in the Treaty of the European Union which would allow to do so, because urban policies for the moment remain the competence of the member states. However, Nonetheless, with all our European policies which impact directly or indirectly on urban development, we have a big say. We have an incredible uh, power of action there 
to support sustainable development in cities. And this is precisely what we intend to use, and in particular what we intend to use in our responses to the recommendations <coughs> put forward by the various partnerships of the urban agenda for the European uh, Union, and in particular when it comes to the European pillar of social rights, the partnerships on urban poverty, the partnerships on the inclusion of migrants and refugees, the partnerships on housing, and the partnership on job and skills, which are all acting towards delivering the European pillar of social rights. And we also have the urban innovative actions, uh, which we finance up to 200 million euros, if I remember correctly, which address territorial inequalities and which have been participating in one of the projects, which is part of the pledges made by Eurocities when it comes to further supporting the European pillar of social rights. Now, to conclude, I would like to say a few words in particular about our urban agenda for the European Union Migration Partnership, because it is part of the very first generation of urban agenda partnerships. And it was among the first one to finalize its action plan, and it is already engaged into implementation of it. And that replies precisely to Annalisa's uh, question. I would like to say that the Commission is ready to support further the implementation of this partnership. I have already made it uh, public uh, in several uh, occasions, and the funding, the corresponding funding, has been put aside in this respect. And I would like to finish by illustrating uh, our actions under the urban agenda for the European Union with two of its flagship initiatives. First of all, the Migrant Advisory Board, which brings together young people with a migrant background to contribute to local policy making in several European cities. And secondly, the Academy of Practitioners, which aims to further develop integration policy. Now, the Partnership on Migration also contributed, quite forcefully, by the way, to the discussion on the next multi-annual financial framework, and it also highlighted the importance of tackling education segregation in urban areas. When it comes to the urban agenda for the European Union, which is an intergovernmental initiative, it is led by the member states, but the European Commission is in charge of implementing it, so we are leading in terms of operational uh, management. We have also committed ourselves to actually follow up in terms of either regulation or policies or funding the proposals of the action plan. And we have made public our first reactions, comments, to the proposals which have been made by the first uh, corresponding uh, action plans of the partnerships. Last but not least, echoing also what Jan has been saying when it comes to integration of funds, and in particular ESF and ERDF. The European Commission in the field of migration has been working together with DG Home to propose to the managing authorities and to the project promoters a specific tool which is extremely pragmatic, extremely um, operational. We actually put ourselves, this is rare in the European Commission, we put ourselves into the feet of the project promoters at ground level in order to describe and to explain how to develop complex projects involving several funds from the very first moment of the arrival of refugees, so emergency situation, emergency funding, for instance, with the IMF fund, moving towards social and long-term integration with ESF and uh, ERDF. And we intend to update this toolkit, of course, to take into consideration the new regulations for the post-2020 period. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's thanks to people like uh, Wallis and others that today, if I may say, the European Union is looking at cities in a different way. Yeah? The, the, the role we play is being better recognized now. We are still very far from a, an urban policy for the EU, but okay, we, we continue the, the battle. Now, we don't have much time. I would like, but still, even if we are a bit late, I'd like to eat some of the lunch. <laughs> so eat in terms of time. So if we can at least open a little bit uh, the, the debate with the floor uh, and have a couple of uh, questions from, from you, uh, if you want to comment on any of uh, what has been said and then have like one second, two seconds each, uh, one word each to, to conclude. 
Uh, but yes, is there anybody? I know that there is the Romanian presidency that is in the room, yeah, who wanted to have a quick word, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, let me thank you, thank the organizer for this very timely event. Uh, right after yesterday, World of um, uh, World Day of Social Justice, uh, and for giving me the floor to briefly present the Romanian presidency work in building a more inclusive and fairer uh, European Union. Uh, very briefly about our presidency, we envisage it to be citizen-centered, uh, future-oriented, ambitious, but at the same time realistic. And I say realistic due to the time constraints to conclude on the legislative files uh, due to the parliament elections we, we have in, in May. And as a motto, we selected cohesion, a common European value, which is a call for European unity and uh, convergence. With this in mind, and considering that Romania has been a supporter of the European pillar of social rights, the Romanian presidency has uh, prioritized the legislative files, which were follow-ups of, uh, of the social pillar. And from my, uh, in my short intervention, I would like to expand a bit on uh, one uh, file that was mentioned uh, bo both by um, Ms. Rodriguez and also by a uh, commission representative, which is transparent and predictable working condition. Uh, indeed, it was a hard work together with the European Parliament and Commission, and sometimes the meetings uh, lasted until 3 a.m., but uh, we believe that once adopti adoptive, adopted, the, this directive will bring concrete benefits to workers in the EU. And uh, to start with, uh, we are talking about more complete information on the essential aspects of the work that the uh, workers are going to, to receive. And just to give you a, um, some examples compared to the current situation, the workers are going to be also informed about the duration of the probation period, about training entitlements uh, provided by the employer, and for instance, the social security institutions where the employer is, uh, is paying the, the social contributions. At the same time, uh, out of this information package, uh, the very essential ones are going to be given to the worker to the worker uh, up to the uh, to seven calendars day, which is again a big step forward uh, compared to the current situation, which is up to two months, and the rest of the information in uh, within one month. Uh, also through this uh, uh, file, uh, new rights are um, are provided, like uh, setting a limit to the length of of the probationary period. Uh, seeking additional employment, uh, and over there, we, there, is, uh, there, is, there are provisions on um, uh, a ban on exclusivity uh, clauses and limits on incompatibility clauses. Uh, also, there is the right to receive cost-free, uh, the mandatory training that the employer has to, to provide. And uh, one last uh, thing that I would like to point out is um, are the specific provisions um, for workers with very unpredictable work pattern, for instance, the case of on-demand work, uh, which will have the right from now on to know within a reasonable period uh, uh, in advance when the work will, uh, will, be, will take place. And um, I believe of, in a nutshell, those are the, the, the those are concrete ways to, in which we we all three institutions are modernizing the European labor law and uh, adjusting it to the new forms of uh, of work. And uh, from our perspective, it is indeed a major milestone to to make the principles of the European pillar of social rights into um, um, concrete and a, a reality for for our workers. Uh, both me and my colleague are going to be here for lunch in case there are specific questions or uh, you would like to discuss about other uh, files that we concluded during our presidency, we would be happy to, to share more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this intervention. Um, it's good to see that 
one member state and as a president is, is uh, pushing along the, the idea of the social pillar and putting it high on the agenda, very positive. So one question, I see Madrid, uh, Ramon Palomino, one quest. Thanks. Uh, one quick question. Uh, the members of the panel, even though I know that uh, the states are not represented in the panel, we the cities face uh, usually a problem when it comes to integrate uh, the most vulnerable groups, which are the migrants. And uh, we're not uh, considering them migrants anymore, we're the citizens. They live with us, amongst us, so they're citizens. The problem is that many of them have this irregular administrative status. It's impossible for the cities to integrate anybody who cannot work, who cannot rent a house in the formal market. And I know that this, this is a state competence, mostly, and uh, the EU institutions cannot uh, directly impact. But is there anything, or can you uh, help us, assist us, and tell us what we can do? Because it's not a competence, but it's a city problem. It's a city reality. And it's very complicated to integrate vulnerable groups, but it's even more complicated to integrate those who cannot uh, actually uh, be part of the regular path that our cities are, are developing. Thanks. Who wants to take this uh, quick uh, answer? <laughs> no, DJ, we, we would need DJ Home, maybe? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yes, thank you for the impossible question. Uh, no, as, as you can expect, there is no uh, easy, easy answer. Um, but we are uh, also, f for example, through the um, uh, social fund, uh, we are supporting uh, non-governmental organizations that deal with um, migrants um, uh, with uh, sort of unclear status uh, as, as, as well. Um, obviously, in terms of direct support, uh, we uh, can uh, support only those who have some sort of a legal status. But there are organizations uh, being supported by the funds that, uh, uh, that are helping the uh, people. Uh, one of the one of the examples, and uh, we know that some countries are using that, is the uh, uh, European Fund for the Most Deprived, uh, which uh, uh, aims to provide um, uh, very basic assistance in terms of food, mainly, um, uh, uh, where uh, normally no questions are asked in terms of, uh, uh, or should be asked. Uh, in terms of who receives the uh, the support, so there are various instruments. But as you said, I mean, th there is no there is no single uh, uh, magic answer that uh, uh, can solve the uh, situation of irregular uh, of irregular oh. migrants. But there are maybe um, uh, different streams that can support your work uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the uh, cities can tackle uh, the situation effectively. Okay. If I may add... Well, it's really sure. Yeah. DG Home of the European Commission uh, manages the IMF Fund, uh, Asylum Migration Fund, mm. and they provide for emergency support, and there they do not distinguish according to the status of the, of the people. But it's only for very short-term integration measures. For the rest, the people have to have legal status. Okay. So, we, yes... Just one test is you, are, you are touched something which is absolutely crucial, but this is uh, <coughs> what, what we can, you could say what we can do. I mean, the, what, what is absolutely important is the pressure on the governments to make the decision concerning the asylum system in Europe, the immigration system of European Union. We, we, but this is, it should be the very clear pressure coming from the cities, because if it's not solved, I mean, all the revision of Dublin system, etc., etc., it should be solved. We know that it's, it's not solved, I and mean, what you mentioned, but I think this concrete example should be the kind of pressure on the governments publicly, publicly, that it, because without the conclusion on the European level, it will be still the same, and the citizens will have the responsibility to, to have the, all the consequences of lacking of the, of the law. So you, the cities are taking all the charges because of the lack of the law. So I think it should be very clear uh, to say that, uh, and for all the governments of Europe. <laughs> yes, but this is only half of the problem. 
I mean, the asylum process is only half of the problem because migrants are getting in and out of legality because of national legislation. So only talking about refugees who are waiting in line is half of the reality. The other half of the reality is national policy that doesn't allow people to integrate and kicks them out of the system. So talking only about the, the role of states and what the Commission is doing, the problem is that we are looking at it as a security issue. We are dealing with DG Home instead of dealing with DG, I don't know, employment or someone else. So we are looking at it as a security issue and not as a social issue. And this is a problem. And for the cities, and I'm coming from a country that has been convicted of slavery, I have to remind you, from the European Court of Human Rights, and the same applies for the south of Spain and the south of Italy. They're not convicted, that's the only difference. So. If we are talking about black market uh, labor, etc., etc., it's only half of the problem. So we need to think about it more carefully. You know, talk for hours. Very interesting. Is there anybody? One small comment, question, really small, please. Uh, I just want to ask about the uh, invest ter territorial. Uh, integrated territorial investments, what is your opinion about it and what will be the future of that instrument? I would like to remind that as Eurocities we were fighting for that instrument, so what would be the future of that? We asked for the tenth. Yes. ITI will remain in place. So you will, be, you will continue having the possibility of using integrated territorial instrument, uh, CLLDs as well, and so forth, uh, under uh, PO5, of course, uh, but you could also be using it under PO1, PO2, PO3, PO4. So this is foreseen, and uh, I don't remember exactly the, the reference in the, in the CPR, but it is there and extremely well described. In the RDF. In the, in the proposal of the Commission, it was 6%. In the proposal of, of Eurocities, it was 10 In the proposal of Parliament, it's 10 So uh, uh, I just want to, to add. Sorry, that is a bit different. I thought your question was about the integrated territorial instrument. Yeah, yeah. What Yat is talking about now is, is ear about earmarking, urban earmarking. And indeed, in the proposal of the European Commission, it is at 6%. Uh, coming from 5%, uh, so we adjusted to new circumstances. No, this, this is exactly what the question was. The question was about is it 5 or 6 or 10? So I think that this is a quite definition, but I understand that this is a question about the 5 or what was now 5, it will be 5. So the proposal of your city is 10, we will defend 10, maybe we will finish with 8, we will see. Yeah. It's all in the hands of the member states now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Can I? Uh, one, th one thing I take over is that uh, my colleague Jan said great approach the thing why we are here uh, I hope uh, it will also continue with the work of subsidies that this integrated approach is working uh, in the cities Thank you very much. I'm thinking about sort of the social pillar as such, because um, uh, many years ago, a friend of mine worked with a social worker in Marseille, and the social worker said that, well, we have to, to work with these issues, because what is the alternative, really? We will have riots. We will have people um, sort of claiming their rights. We will build walls within our cities. And despite the fact that we all come from, from different regions, we come from different histories, we have different welfare models, I think it's important that we find the, the least common factor, at least, in working together uh, for, for the sort of the best for all people. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, let's be optimistic. Uh, it means that uh, Everything we are talking here about the RDFS, et cetera, is about urban policy. Urban policy don't worry exist. That would, let's do it legal. Thank you. 
I can I can only uh, support the um, uh, the implementation of the social pillar and remind to everybody that this is not a, a um, project that uh, should stay uh, in the highest level of uh, policy making, but uh, it needs to be translated into um, actions, proposals, and activities. And I'm extremely grateful, uh, uh, and the Commission is extremely grateful for the Eurocities uh, um, and uh, uh, and different other cities um, uh, that are part of this process that uh, uh, they're pledging to, to implement that and uh, we will provide uh, and we will continue to provide our support to these uh, actions. Thank you. Okay. I would say that today it is impossible to look at social inequalities in isolation from territorial inequalities. And this is one of the reasons why we can be happy that in its proposal for post-2020, the Commission has put forward a new policy objective. Uh, it's a brand new one, uh, policy objective five, getting Europe closer to its citizens, uh, under which we will have the possibility to develop integrated strategies for sustainable development, uh, including when it comes to social inclusion. This is absolutely essential, and we see it everywhere in Europe uh, at the moment, and in particular in the country I'm coming from, where you have many, many uh, demonstrations uh, about this uh, new fact. Les gilets jaunes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. A big hand to our panelists. <laughs> and now, just bear with us, as an antipasto to the next session and transition, we would like to show a short video about our work on housing, because that's the theme of the next session. We prepared it after our study visit in Vienna. That's it. Please enjoy. Andreas and Franziska are two Vienna residents that have been friends since school. Andreas is a 40 years old professional firefighter. Like many of his fellow citizens, he has a lot of difficulties in finding a place to live on the private market. The rising cost of living is a huge challenge in his life, as the housing on the private market requires more than half of his income. To find a solution, Andreas has registered at Vina Woman, the one-stop shop service point for people searching for subsidies or municipal housing. In Vienna, one in four people lives in municipal housing, like Andreas. Vienna invests 532 million euros per year in social and affordable housing. The city has a stock of municipal and subsidized housing units, which represents 45% of the housing market. Thanks to this public service, Andreas has been assigned a 40 square meter flat at 400 euros per month. This is half of what it would cost on the private rental market and only requires a third of his monthly income. Vienna itself owns about 220,000 housing units. It's the biggest municipal housing company here in Europe. Wiener Wohn is a social housing company. That means we are also taking care of our tenants in case they do get some problems. With problems, it means, for example, rent arrears, people stop uh, paying their rent. And we got an outreaching work, social workers, which are going there and trying to help people. Andreas registered at Wiener Wohnen following the advice of his friend, Franziska. She's a single mother of a baby daughter living in municipal housing. Franziska has a part-time job as a nurse, but her monthly income can't sustain her family. After not being able to pay the rent for her apartment, she was at risk of being evicted. Social workers on behalf of the city reacted in time to prevent Francisca from being evicted. Case managers are now able to provide a new service and give social guidance to tenants living in municipal housing. This helped Francisca to find a solution for her debt, to apply for housing benefits, to consider enrolling her daughter in a public kindergarten, in the end, to keep her apartment. Vienna was recently recognized as the city with the best quality of life in Europe. This, in part, is due to the social services the city provides to its inhabitants, with a special focus on public housing. To learn from Vienna, EuroCities organized a study visit of its working groups, homelessness and housing to the Austrian capital. Around 50 social housing managers from 18 European cities attended the event. They exchanged experiences, 
challenges and best practices on social housing. However, the one thing that's impressed me is the um, direct intervention by social workers, where they actually go out to the, the residents, they phone them, if they can't get them, they go and visit them, if they can't get them that way, they'll continue to follow up till they get an intervention, and that seems to be having a really positive impact on reducing the number of actual evictions. So that looks like something we could possibly replicate. City experts discussed how to replicate the practice that has helped Andreas and Francisca to prevent homelessness throughout Europe. Housing is a human right, and it is also a key principle of the European pillar of social rights. Tackling homelessness and promoting affordable housing are key priorities for Eurocities in the field of social affairs. So, welcome to the second part of this panel. I'm Silvia Ganzarla, I'm a policy director in Eurocities. And uh, this video was uh, the right transition to the topic of uh, this panel, who's focusing on principle 19 of the pillar. And we're going to discuss now the importance of housing and assistance for the homeless. I'd like to uh, start this panel by just giving you uh, an indicator. Half of the cities that uh, committed to implement the pillar of social rights made a pledge on housing and assistance to homeless. This is an indicator of how important it is, uh, this issue, at local level, and especially for cities. I'd like to give the floor to Laila Ortiz, Deputy Mayor of Barcelona, responsible for social rights. Uh, Barcelona has invested, has committed to invest, 182 million euros per year in affordable housing. Laila, why housing is so important in a city like Barcelona? Uh, good, good afternoon already. Um, thank you very much for organizing this, this panel for, for us. And when I was working on, on Social Affairs Forum, uh, since the beginning, we, we thought that housing was a was a problem. It's a problem from, for Barcelona, but I think that it's a, the priority and the biggest problem for most of the cities, even Vienna, no? that it's, uh, has been leading for hundreds of years. No? The, the, the housing policies has this as a, a, as a big problem. So it's an European problem and it's a, 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 local, a local problem that we have to face quite alone uh, sometimes. From, from Barcelona, um, it's especially difficult because we have less than 2% of, the, of, the, of social housing. So if we have the same problem in Vienna, like Andreas, no, that fire, fire, but without, without the, um, the housing. So we need to invest. So we need more uh, local housing, we, public housing. We also need to change the kind of supports because the, the, the increase in rents, we need to put more uh, investment in help people just to pay the rent. We also uh, have to fight the speculation. I mean, we have a, a really a big problem with the international funds that are just investing, waiting that the houses increase the, their value. This is a big problem, not only here, I think in Amsterdam, in Vienna, in Berlin. And also that the, that, that the families in general uh, have to spend more than the 40% of the income just to, just to survive. So when, when we come to Europe to say, okay, um, I think that this is the first problem. In Barcelona, 80% um, of the poverty has to do with housing problems. So can you imagine how different the situation would be if we solve the housing problems in, in, in Barcelona? So I think that we have to say that we cannot do it alone. I mean, we invest and we are really committed to, to, to housing policies. But it's not only a social problem that I think that should be also a priority, the social things for, for European Union, but it's also an economic problem. I mean, 
What happened when the families cannot afford, they have to spend every, no, all the income just in, in, in housing, the impact in all the economy is very important. And also the impact that the big investors are putting their money, not in productive <laughs> economy, but just in, in, in housing. So I think that is one, it should be one of the priorities of the next commission. That's why our, our mayor, Ada, Ada Colau, all together with the other cities, uh, made a declaration at the United uh, Nations uh, and cities like Vienna that have been leading also the partnership with pr very concrete proposals to, to, to the Commission that things that, that the cities need, just to, to make a political platform to push a change in, in housing. I mean, we have problems. All the cities uh, need a change. We need laws. We need investment, and we need to, to face housing as a, a really economic and social problem. And if all the, the, the European policy does not focus on that, um, I think that it will be a really a, a disaster. The data are there. I mean, FEANSA, Housing Europe are showing us uh, what's happening. In Berlin, for example, uh, it has doubled the people uh, in shelters in only two years. I mean, 10,000 10, people more in, in shelters. So it's thing, we have to talk about this and we have to push that it, it be in the European agenda, definitely. Thank you, Laila, for your intervention. I think that is very, uh, very crucial that uh, it's our cities that are raising this, uh, this problem. And uh, our cities that, in, in a certain way, are pushing the, the European level to consider and take some actions. I'd like now to give the floor to Agnes Ongerius, who is uh, uh, the Vice Chair of the Employment Committee. And uh, you've been responsible for uh, the opinion on ESF+. Plus. And it's very interesting that the future ESF+, Plus, if the regulation stays as it is, uh, will have a focus on uh, affordable assistance to housing. What difference is going to make the new provision in ESF+. Plus? Um, very good question. Um... I don't know yet, huh? because the negotiation still has to uh, follow, because we have an opinion, we have a regulation around uh, the CPR, uh, it has been concluded, the Parliament's position has been concluded in the Reggie Committee and in the plenary, but now the work has to be done in reality. Uh, uh, but I think... For this panel, I think it would be wise to slightly look back and look forwards again, because um, before coming to the European Parliament, uh, I worked for a very long time in the trade union movement in the Netherlands. And uh, as a person, I'm a little bit impatient. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but now, uh, if you're looking back for this last four and a half years, it was Juncker who started his term by saying, uh, I'm working to a Europe which is also in, social, in the social field triple A, uh, which seems nice, but then uh, you tend to think, what does this mean? Uh, uh, but he delivered uh, the social pillar in November 2017, uh, and today we are discussing how cities can contribute. So. Uh, even for an impatient person, uh, this is in four uh, years' time quite a big development. Uh, uh, the moreover, if you take into consideration how, for instance, my Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, he was there in Gothenburg, uh, also at the signing ceremony, uh, and when he left the building, uh, he answered to journalists, uh, I'm not even going to put this uh, social pillar on my bookshelf uh, because this is uh, nothing to uh, have any value. Uh, and I am like to see that cities are taking this seriously uh, because this is what we uh, need. And I'm especially proud that the elder man of my own hometown uh, uh, pledged, uh, and Utrecht pledged as the first town in the Netherlands, so I'm a happy bunny today. 
um, but I'd like to use this example uh, for uh, saying we ever now and then in my country, in other countries, are quite selective in dealing with European legislation, and especially so if it comes to housing. Uh, you see that uh, the uh, housing legislation is being implemented in the different member states in a very different uh, uh, way. So the European uh, law only states that uh, member states have to accommodate social housing for the social disadvantaged groups. And in the Netherlands, we interpreted this uh, as a fixed income limit for social housing at 35,000 euros, which means indeed, ex uh, as example uh, in the, the video of Vienna, that a teacher, a police officer, a bus driver, a firefighter, they are pushed to their private market. Uh, uh, and where more often than not, especially in big cities as Amsterdam, as is Utrecht, uh, it's impossible to find proper housing. And I think when talking about uh, uh, the um, uh, pledge number 19, it's very important that we uh, indeed take care of the most vulnerable people, uh, people who are homeless, uh, who are... Uh, 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 who are over uh, drug addicts or asylum seekers. So I value the work done uh, by the city council in this uh, uh, respect. But I think if you are talking about inclusive housing, uh, if you are talking about inclusive cities, I also don't want cities where only people with my income can live in the center of town, uh, and uh, ordinary working people are pushed to the outside boundaries uh, or to, uh, indeed, uh, uh, smaller communities 30, 40, 50 kilometers out of their, uh, uh, their job. I think that would mean an empty city, uh, uh, which uh, is, I think, uh, very much a pity. Uh, the Netherlands can take an a, a, a example from Vienna. They can take an example from Sweden, where they also interpreted this European law in a different way as the Netherlands uh, uh, did. Uh, and uh, for some member states, and uh, not mine, huh, uh, the ESF Plus uh, uh, fund will help uh, because social inclusion is at the core of it and proper uh, affordable housing is a necessity uh, to, peop to include people in cities. So I think this is helpful uh, for, um, let's say, uh, uh, some member states which are not uh, too uh, uh, well off. We have this example in the Czech Republic, where they made a successful application of ESF funding for social houses, so it can be done. Uh, but please do not forget uh, that there are also around social houses, housing uh, other issues at, uh, at stake, because I also would like to think that the ordinary teacher uh, in Utrecht doesn't uh, 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 tend to think the local council is only taking care of homeless people. Uh, uh, and while I'm providing a very important service to the city, I will uh, uh, find a, uh, um, I will, uh, will hear no from uh, the city council. And we don't need European funding. We, all, we only need a proper, proper uh, debate about what does European law uh, 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 seduces us to do, uh, and what do they prohibit? Uh, and uh, being here now for four and a half years, I, I really get annoyed when people say this is Brussels to blame, this is not Brussels to blame, this is the Netherlands to blame. Uh, so if we want uh, real inclusive cities, we need to help the homeless, uh, but we also need to help the middle class looking for affordable housing. Thank you very much, Agnes. Uh, 
well deserved. I think that you raise a very important issue that the housing crisis is not just for the most vulnerable, is the middle class who's suffering in, uh, in finding adequate housing at the moment. Uh, and you raise the issue of the role of member states uh, because the implementation of regulation is done in different ways in different member states. We will come back to the role of the member states later on. But now I would like to give the floor to Katerina Ivankovic, Director for Social Affairs in DG Employment for, uh, from the European Commission. I, I'd like to, um, to introduce you by saying that as Eurocities, we were very happy to see housing in the social pillar. Because as cities, we've, uh, we've, we've tried to communicate to the European Commission that housing is a crucial element for the social inclusion of people, for the social cohesion of uh, cities. And this is crucial. So I'd like to give you the floor, and then you can uh, just give your comments on how DG Employment is going to look at this issue, uh, starting from now, but also looking at the future. Thank you. Uh, well, if we start from the, from the principle 19 of the, of the pillar, it says clearly, access to social housing or housing assistance of good quality shall be provided for those in need, and also refers to vulnerable people, including homeless. Uh, why am I saying this? Because it's important uh, to know what is the idea of the pillar and what was the idea of the pillar. Uh, I also understand the need to discuss a bit about affordable housing and the ways how to approach to the affordable housing in general because indeed it is a problem. Indeed we have the uh, many of our fellow citizens who are uh, low, who have low skills, low level of education, low, le low paid jobs and who are also facing many difficult problems. And, but we always have to have in mind that we have those who cannot help themselves no, in no other way but to, to need and to seek the assistance from either national authorities or local or regional or some other way. So when having in this mind, I think it's important to look, work on both tracks having the clear mandate from the pillar, what could be done, how could it be done, is, is a question. And uh, when it comes to the rest of the affordable housing, that also is something that could be addressed to the various instruments. So first, uh, first of all, uh, I would like, I would share with you that uh, maybe last few years, uh, starting somewhere from 2013, I would say we're not very much in favor of, favor of the social housing. It, at that time, those who were in power at that time did not find actually the social housing to be on the agenda of the, of the funds, uh, really in a small portion in the ERDF. Uh, in the ESF, it was always touched uh, upon certain aspects of social inclusion, which would be, today we would consider those as supporting measures a bit more than measures that would help and prevent somebody from uh, becoming a homeless person or being the most disadvantaged ones. I remember that time that uh, there were lots of discussions how, why, how, etc., etc. I think it's really, it should be appreciated and it should be really seen as a positive outcome that this commission has put social housing on the agenda. I think it's visible in every document that we produce. It's visible uh, in the proposal of uh, ERDF. It is visible in the proposal of ESF+. Plus. Now there are some initiatives to use ESF plus funds for the social infrastructure. Me personally, I can now please disregard my position. I will tell you just my personal opinion. I always think it's good to have the distinction what is ERDF, what is ESF, but I dream of a day that ESF and ERDF will work together, that the same authorities are going to implement both funds. If I can influence even one member state to start with a real implementation and real integrated activities, I think we would be all in a win-win situation. So in this respect, I don't think it would be because when you open the, the, the social infrastructure, uh, 
it's very difficult to open it in one area. How do you prioritize? Can you say that the childcare is not the priority? Can you say that the education is not priority? In those member states where have, where, which suffer from insufficient long-term care, those member states that have issues with the, with the health care, and then we come, where is the housing in this one? In order to put it really top on the agenda, I don't think that any other than integrated approach will work. Uh, when it comes, so, in the, in the priority objective four, there is a clear list of, of activities that could, uh, that could go fall under the regional fund or, or the ESF plus, and as I said, they need to be integrated. I think with InvestEU, we could, I, wouldn't, I don't like the word play, but we could try to work a bit more into the area of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, the instruments that InvestEU is provi providing, such as subsidized loans, such as subsidized interest rates, or guarantees, or some other instruments of the financial nature, could provide an additional assistance, an additional boost to, the, to those that will select the housing as one of the topics. I can tell you that uh, my directorate is uh, developing a product under the, preparing actually the product under the InvestEU in the area of housing. Uh, we are working in the area of social housing and combating the, the, the uh, homelessness, but we are also really reconsidering the area of affordable housing. So in this respect, uh, I would also like to hear what are your ideas, where, where do you find yourself, how do you, how do you fit uh, among, among those uh, ideas and principles actually that, uh, that we just mentioned. There is also urban agenda should not be disregarded. Uh, integrated territorial investment, sorry valleys, but they don't work. In many member states, they, died, they just didn't find a way how to, how to manage the operational uh, aspects, how mm -hmm. to manage the administrative burden, the, the bureaucracy, how to have a clear division, who does what, what is done in national authority, what is done at, at, at the city's level. There are those brilliant examples, and I think we should speak about it more. We should see who is doing good and why and try to promote such a, such a good, uh, good uh, uh, practices. And also for those that are not del delivering, I think we should just push them because in the urban uh, areas face such a different challenges than the rest of the, of the country that it's, in my mind, it's, it's a completely unreasonable and impossible not to meet, uh, not to meet it. Also, uh, we see, we have a bit more success, I can say, in the deprived areas where the interventions are of the small, smaller scale, but in this respect, please don't forget the small cities, don't forget the rural areas because they also, Play important role in the whole process. I think I already spoke uh, spoke a lot, <laughs> and I hope I open some some of the questions. I hope I provoke some of you to provide some answers and ideas because I think we are always uh, lacking uh, good and new ideas and new views. So please. Thank you, Katarina, for your intervention and for highlighting the complexity of housing from the most vulnerable people to the middle class. I think that uh, we will have uh, future opportunities to exchange on what are the real issue. But now, uh, because we are also pressed with time, I'd like to give the floor to Kait Kuze, the Chair of Social Protection Committee of DG Employment. And I'd like to start by saying that uh, from the, the report you had last year, it came out that uh, housing is uh, a crucial issue in 11 member states. Um, you, you heard about the role of cities, the role of the Parliament and European Commission. Can you tell us about how we can all work with member states? Because clearly we are not going to solve the situation of a housing crisis, crisis just between cities and the European level. We need member states level. Thank you. And, uh also, greetings from the Social Protection Committee. Listening all those debates, I have to congratulate you. It has been very interesting so far, and I kind of uh, 
felt that, uh, that there are many ways of uh, being engaged in those discussions because I'm also at my uh, own country responsible for the social policy, so a lot of interaction between the cities, between the municipalities and so on. And, uh, but here I am uh, uh, in the role of the chair of uh, Social Protection Committee, which uh, is uh, tasked with monitoring uh, the social situation uh, and the development of social policies in the EU and uh, does it on behalf of the EPSCO. So um, uh, when we uh, look at the domain we are speaking at the moment, so we uh, uh, must say that uh, we have long advocated that the homelessness and access uh, to affordable housing in the EU is a growing challenge. So I wouldn't say uh, that it's just limited with 11 member states. I think that the challenge is uh, actually seen like for everyone, even those who are performing better than others. So uh, Social Protection Committee sees that uh, there are evidence that uh, there are a high level of homelessness and housing, housing costs overburden, long waiting lists to enter into social housing and increasing hardship faced by young people in entering the housing market. So, so um, looking at the pillar, I think that uh, this is a joint uh, journey. Uh, its implementation should fully respect the principle of subsidiarity and the role of local and regional governments, social partners and the civil society in delivering uh, social policies in member states. But again, as was said earlier as well, most social policies are implemented at local level, which makes cities essential partners in delivering pillar principles. So uh, what is the SBC's experience and, and what we are doing at the moment? So I would like to highlight with a few words uh, our uh, annual plans. Uh, we uh, have equally important function uh, also to promote cooperation and to serve as a forum uh, of exchange and per le learning between the member states. So this year we have planned several um, events um, uh, which are relevant to the challenge we are discussing here at the moment. For example, in September we will hold a thematic review on homelessness and housing exclusion, which will feed in uh, the discussions of EPSCO under the Finnish presidency. Belgium will also host a peer review dedicated to access to social assistance and rights for homeless people. The Czech Republic will hold a review on the topic uh, addressing housing exclusion without appropriate uh, legislative support. So I think that uh, that actually uh, is uh, quite evident that the Social Protection Committee uh, tries uh, uh, quite a lot to debate about the uh, issue and, and uh, puts uh, this uh, topic uh, quite uh, high in the agenda. Um, maybe just uh, not to uh, talk too much uh, at this point, uh, I would also like to address uh, one key challenge what we have uh, in terms of the policy uh, learning and policy debate. I think the big challenge can be named uh, with one word, which is uh, data. And uh, do we have enough data? Do we have qualitative data about the uh, country's, uh, let's say, challenges? And, uh, well, my committee through its sub-indicator group is working on selecting and developing indicators to monitor the social situation in the EU and also including the field we are talking here. But uh, still, the data issue remains uh, kind of a big challenge in order to get a full picture of uh, challenges across Europe. So... Uh, here I would end my contribution for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wright. I, I do agree, data is very important. We are committed to evidence-based policy making. And uh, clearly there's a need to connect all the different research and data collection that are taking place already at European level, maybe to improve and just to have a look at where the data gap is. So it's a, it's a conversation that we need to, to continue for the future. I'd like now to give the floor to Soka Edward, Secretary General of Housing Europe. Soka, we've been together in the housing partnership as part of the urban agenda. So you know how important it was to have one single uh, point to discuss housing in all the different uh, aspects, not just uh, social economic investments, uh, but all together. And uh, I'd like to, 
to ask you a question that is, uh, is pretty much about the role of a third sector in helping cities to have the right stock of housing because we've been discussed the role of uh, the public sector here and you also have a lot to contribute uh, to, to solve the housing crisis in cities. Thank you, Sylvia. Oh, yes. Have a lift. So, yes, thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, and thank you very much to your cities for giving us uh, some space on the panel here today. Um, as Sylvia said, we've been working very closely over the last three years on, in the housing partnership of the Urban Agenda under the leadership of Slovakia and the City of Vienna with a concrete action plan on the table, which is going to give us a lot of um, ammunition, let's say, to go forward. So maybe just a quick introduction into Housing Europe. So we've been working here in Brussels since 1988. Uh, we're bringing together 45 national and regional federations. And under those federations are 43,000 um, public, social and cooperative housing providers in 24 countries. Um, so we can clearly see that uh, compared to when we started 30 years ago, the housing situation for Europeans is completely different and the role of the housing providers we work with is completely different. I think uh, my colleagues here on this, this great panel today have, have pointed out really, um, uh, the global and European cycle we are in when it comes to housing. We're really in a pattern where housing is something that is taking from society. It is taking people's dignity, leaving them homeless, um, and we've seen growing figures. The only country not growing is, um, is in Finland. It is um, leading to overcrowding situations, again, taking away people's privacy and dignity. It's giving opportunities to land, um, let's say, uh, landlords, some in the private sector, to take advantage of, of this situation, to exploit the scarcity and continue to undermine dignity. Um, it's taking time. So as people work, have to work um, far away from their place of home and spend more hours in public transport with their children spending more hours in childcare, it's taking time from the households, but it's also taking from our economies, the economies of cities and the economies of our societies. In fact, Eurofound estimate um, 193 billion is wasted because we don't have enough adequate energy efficient housing. It's taking people again far away from their jobs. The last study from Eurostat on that said most Europeans in capital cities feel that they can't find a house close to somewhere, an affordable house close to somewhere where they can work. So I think the spirit in the room today and the spirit in the partnership and the spirit we see from this excellent initiative of Eurocities to turn the pillar into something that Mr. Ruta won't even put on his bookshelf, into something that's going to trigger investment throughout Europe. And uh, when we've seen that nine out of 21 of the cities um, who have pledged to this um, initiative are actually focusing on, um, on um, 19, so um, and Act 19 of the pillar, which is related to access to affordable housing for those in need. So that is really um, a spirit, and I think it's a spirit we have to take forward. And there's no mystery what I'm going to say next, although um, probably if you look up to, the, to the, what we're going to, the event we're going to focus on a little bit, so the 4th to the 9th of June, the European Social Housing Festival. So last year, we have Vienna was the mecca of social housing. Uh, we, we all met in December and saw a really impressive project. But this year, Lyon is the mecca of uh, social housing in Europe. And I hope many of you have already received invitations from, from, um, from the Metropole of Lyon, uh, Mr. Kimmelfeld, to be there. And I really invite particularly those who have pledged on housing today to be there, to be present. Um, and although the, the poster might be a bit mysterious, <laughs> I think it brings different points to different uh, people, um, it's no mystery what we want to focus on in Lyon. We want to focus on housing that gives back. Housing that gives back the right to, ho the right to a roof, but not only that, housing that gives back the right to the city and the housing that gives a springboard out of poverty. Housing that gives access, uh, enables access to employment, to training, to transport, to healthcare, uh, to make cities that are inspiring, cities that can in continue to include 
not only the 1% or the 10%, but continue to welcome students, migrants, nurses, teachers, and all of us people who are not in the, in the 1%. So that's um, um, what we would be bringing to you in Lyon, and it's what Housing Europe is working on a daily basis. So it's bringing those... Um, so it's um, 43,000 public cooperative social housing organisations that are bringing to Europeans housing that gives back to society. And I think we really feel this sense of, of um, a spirit that is, is uh, change. Change is in the air as, uh, as the impressive cities here in the room today are really committing also to a, to a change in the spirit away from housing that takes to housing that Gives back, gives back to people, to the economy, to cities, to countries, and of course to Europe. And I think we talked a bit about the European, I mean, the European link to housing. I mean, one of the things we're working on together with Union Sociale pour l'Habitat is actually a virtual museum of social housing in Europe. Um, it already exists for France, but what we have seen is actually. Despite the differences, we share a lot across Europe in the different stages of development of housing. So from the, the, the pre-industrial area, the post-industrial area, the garden city, and then, of course, the development of, of the welfare state. And actually, and I really liked the comment coming from Andreas Schoenström this morning, unfortunately, now we also share the, the common issues around housing exclusion homelessness and lack of affordable housing. Uh, but um, I think this recognition of the common European history should also register somehow uh, within EU institutions. And just finishing really on that point, I think I should come back quickly to the pillar. Sorry, I know you're pushed for time. Is that okay if I come back to the pillar? Yeah? So, um, yes. So I think um, lack of affordable housing in Europe is a ticking time bomb. And we ignore this at our own peril. We cannot separate homelessness from lack of affordable housing. Most of the evictions going on today, a growing number of evictions, are not because of failures of individuals, vulnerable groups. No, it's because the price is unaffordable. They are economically based evictions. So we as policymakers working together have to find a way to integrate and we're more than ready to give ideas and examples and inspiration on how we can do that together and we very much welcome the, um, um, the comment about um, the, the work ongoing for EU Invest and for other instruments to really welcome that but what we have to see is that in fact the European Social Pillar becomes a guideline for EU economic and fiscal policies. So when I'm talking about the, the Stability and Growth Pact, um, which is limiting investment affordable housing in some cases, I'm talking about the state aid rules which were mentioned by, by Agnes. Um, we need to take this European Pillar and mainstream it so that we don't separate these two silos when it comes to housing policy. We need an integrated approach, we've heard the word a lot today, an integrated approach to social housing and a starting point can that on that can be to make sure on, a nine, on um, item 19 in the social pillar, we don't just use the indicators on extreme degra degradation or eviction. No, we use, uh, already Eurostat has it prepared for us, we use the overburden rate as an indicator linked to, linked to point 19. And um, I'll finish on that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soka. And thanks for uh, bringing up this dimension of integrated approach to, to housing. Um, before we continue, I'd like to give... Uh, 10 seconds to Agnes, because uh, she has to leave and we are running very late. So Agnes, in, in a nutshell, in 10 seconds, what is your key message? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, with the clear uh, view uh, uh, of Socha, uh, uh, my plea would also be, uh, uh, please don't separate affordable housing from housing uh, uh, of the uh, homeless. Uh, uh, because I think they are indeed interlinked, uh, uh, and of course, but that's something uh, you can blame the old trade unionists uh, uh, for. Uh, of course, uh, people uh, working in social services, but all in all kinds of uh, parts of the labor markets, uh, uh, working in precarious labor conditions, are, are also the vulnerable ones, and if you don't want that people are blaming migrants or homeless people for their own uh, 
uh, unfortunate uh, uh, position. We have to work on all uh, uh, the uh, items uh, in the social pillar, and I'm uh, ever so happy that uh, now, uh, while my own uh, Prime Minister is not in favour, I have new friends in the cities of Europe uh, for keeping up the fight after the election. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Thanks for being with us. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I hope to continue to work with you, as we've done uh, in this, uh, this part of the Parliament. Thank you. Um, now, we are very late, uh, and there's lunch waiting, but we have uh, four minutes <laughs> to take a couple of uh, questions. You will have uh, 20 seconds, no more than 20 seconds, and then to give uh, uh, the floor back to the panelists for the final comments. So I, I see someone over there. 20 seconds. Well, thank you. I, I think uh, <laughs> we need more than 20 seconds. I'm Aline Adrianica, representing the Committee of the Regions, and we are also involved in the implementation of the pillar. Um, I think that uh, uh, to make the principles of the pillar um, a reality for all Europeans, we need something more, something, some more ambition and some uh, swift action from the European Commission. Uh, we are still waiting for the strategy um, on uh, housing, the European strategy on uh, affordable housing, uh, and also we all, all are waiting uh, an European uh, anti-poverty plan to reduce the number of people uh, at risk of exclusion or poverty, and also adequate measures to protect the platform workers. Uh, I will cut what I wanted to say, uh, ending with the question deriving from what Agnes uh, said uh, at the beginning. Uh, well, I think that uh, the pillar of social rights comes to very well complement the Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, but until we put it in the treaty, how can we make the pillar and its principles imperative, mandatory, and not voluntary or optional um, to all levels of governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks also for being uh, very brief. Uh, I'd like now to take another question over there. Ten seconds. Hello. Yes, it works. My name is Philippe Lulschuld. I'm uh, managing director of the European Union of Developers and uh, Home Builders in the private sector. And I'm quite glad to, to hear that there is uh, really also more uh, interest in really affordable housing. Uh, and uh, we support it. We think that it should be necessary to work together with private developers and uh, companies and cities hand in hand to make sure that long-term investments in, in housing and affordable housing is, is, uh, will be guaranteed. And, um, but we also would like to take, uh, the, uh, we'll take the floor now to, to, to warn a little bit uh, about some bad conceived inclusionary housing schemes on local, uh, on local levels that are uh, shifting the burden towards first-time buyers and renters if you don't uh, find enough gap funding. Uh, in some, some of the cities, European cities, are tending to say to the private developers, you have to, to make sure that there is a percentage of affordable housing below market price, but they don't foresee any compensations. What happens in the reality is that those um, burdens are in fact shifted towards first-time buyers on the housing markets, and which is also a, big, a very big problem. This is one point, and the second point is, of course, we are very uh, in pro and, and, and we are re really support to work together with uh, cities and for fine investments, but we think that, of course, for legal certainty, also the state aid rules have to be respected, because otherwise, if there is a system that is failing, then every, everything, every money has to be given back, and that, can, that could be very disastrous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before uh, we go back to the panelists, uh, I'd like to take a question from the city of Vienna. Again, yeah. 10 seconds. 
Thanks. Uh, in fact, I'm not speaking now as the city of Vienna, but uh, as the, the often mentioned coordinator of the housing partnership in the frame of the EU urban agenda. And I just like to raise my hand and say, this is me. I, we've been doing this job together with a lot of partners now for three years. We have delivered on many of the questions that have been raised now by, by people in the, in the room and in, and in the pledges. I think we should continue the discussion. One problem we have is that housing is not a competence of the European Union. This is why it's very often very complicated to find a way through how do you define legislation, funding, etc. But we can find a way through. So this is the, the proposal we have on the table from our action plan. Uh, and so um, just feel free to come to me also in the break. This is what I wanted to say, product placement. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think by now I'm going to give the floor back to the panelists. Uh, really, 10 seconds because they will kick us out of this room very soon. <laughs> and uh, um, you can react to the comments uh, and you can also give your key message in, uh, in, a, in, a, in two words. Uh, Laila, you can go first. Yeah, I think that we all agree that it's... Um, a majority problem. Housing is a ma it's not just for vulnerable or social or affordable. I think that we have to, to talk about the, a right, a human right, and we have to protect it. And I, I completely disagree that it's not an European uh, competence because the biggest uh, crisis, economic crisis that we have had has related with, the, with housing. In, and it wasn't a private problem. But now, the south of Europe, of course, we have really problems uh, in, the public, in the public budgets just from the, the way that we uh, go out from that crisis. And now we have another bubble, another bubble that has to do with the economy, that has to do with a, a human right, and has to do with many families that cannot afford to, to live in the cities. And it's at, and I'm really agree with Sorsha, it has to do with the sustainability. If we have to move 50 kilometers every day to go to, to find a job, it has to do also uh, with, uh, of course, the, the social pillar. But I think that we have to say now, European Union, not, it's not only that they don't have a strategy for, for housing, it's that we have a lot of barriers and problems to make housing policies in, from, the, from the cities. For example, the market laws, how we can protect uh, the affordable uh, market. Or for example, golden visa are really directly impacting in the speculation uh, market in, uh, in housing. Or other, uh, many other policies that are just in the opposite side that we should be doing. So we win from Barcelona, uh, next month the mayor will be here with other cities just to present a platform to push, to put housing in the European agenda, in the debate at the European uh, elections, uh, of course, on the table on the new commission, because we cannot, uh, we have to, George, we, uh, she was saying that we have to be patient. I think that the problem is too big to wait, to wait some, some more. Thank you, Laila. Caterina. Your uh, yes, key message. Uh, or maybe I should go in the end so I can have the final. Okay, you can do that. So I will just ask uh, Kai to give your uh, final comments. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think that, uh, like in every policy field, the answer is actually in the commitment of the stakeholders in order to move the policy domain further. So that's uh, quite evident. Uh, one, my personal takeaway from here, I, I got kind of uh, this, uh, let's say, confidence uh, of my own thoughts, uh, for my own thoughts uh, about that, that uh, when we are speaking about certain issues uh, and uh, we should uh, perhaps uh, try to speak uh, without using even the word social uh, as um, addition there, if you speak about the social housing only, so it has a very concrete, uh, let's say, stress or accent. And uh, sometimes uh, we need to understand that the social policy as such, uh, it was sounded that social policy tries to hold on the social policy domain and kind of uh, build the walls. Uh, I think that the social policy is uh, the one policy which uh, tries to, 
let's say, dismantle uh, the walls around uh, other policies as well. So if we are speaking about the housing, uh, then we need to speak about housing, not only uh, for those who are more vulnerable. And uh, in that regard, I think that this is uh, also one part of this uh, building the commitment around uh, solving the problems in front of our society, not only from one policy domain perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, thanks, Sophia. So, very quickly, I think, as we are dealing with a lot of, pardon the other one, as we are uh, here in the room with a lot of practitioners, I think I will just bring up again the, the opportunity that there will be in Lyon to see a lot of concrete projects. So, um, we saw, as I said, we saw excellent examples from, from Wiener Wohnen and the limited profit housing cooperatives in Austria. I think you will also be present in Lyon, I hope. So um, and Lyon has also a lot to show in terms of um, housing first, as they've put in their, in their um, pledge for today, um, but also um, prevention of homelessness, but also actually a lot on um, energy efficiency. So they have just launched um, a, um, a, under the Energy Sprung idea, which originally came from the Netherlands, so very fast energy refurbishment to energy positive level of 1,000 homes. So there will be really lots of different, very hands-on examples there in Lyon to, 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 fill, to bring more inspiration and ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we as Eurocities will be in Lyon, so we will see you there. Uh, Katerina, you want to do the final uh, wrap-up of this session on, uh, on the principle 19 of the pillar? Well, thank you so much, and thank you for this privilege to, to wrap it all up. And uh, I'm, I'm just really happy that many questions were open today. I'm very happy to see that uh, the problems and the challenges that we are facing are recognized and brought to the surface. Uh, there are no simple solutions. We can indeed debate what is the competency of the union, what is the national competency. We can even debate should we maybe sometimes in a near or further future think about introducing some additional elements in the treaty. And I think it, we will have a new government, we will have a uh, new parliament who is, who is going to, to put the, pers the picture and I would hope that they would be ambitious one and maybe reopen some of the issues that have been on the table for many years. Uh, I hope that you got the picture that uh, Commission indeed is trying to do a lot in regards to the funding, but also in regards of uh, putting the agenda into the policy perspective. In my own house, we are uh, now really working a lot of actually gathering all of the different stakeholders, not only from DG employment, but also the other DGs who can work on the uh, housing, who can work on different aspects of the of, of, uh, related to the housing. The need that is there, that is see, seen in the light of uh, uh, having the housing as the affordable housing is, is visible, but I ask you please do not forget that social housing is also an important aspect, that homeless needs to be addressed. Maybe we will not have a common EU strategy on combating the homelessness, but maybe we will have it even better in, in the overall uh, strategy of combating the poverty or in, the, in, the, in some other uh, EU instruments or in a toolbox or in a guidelines which would provide uh, sufficient guidance for the member states to follow. Or maybe even we could go into some really serious legislative initiatives. So uh, the good thing is that there are really many options uh, on the table. It is up to us to see how well they will be uh, implemented. As I said many, many times today, I truly believe only in integrated approaches towards the social policy in general. And in this respect, as, as my colleague has said, indeed, the social policy has so many faces. So we need to put all those faces together and really continue to work together. Thank you.
Uh, Katerina, I think that many issues have been raised today on uh, housing. We can all agree that this is the beginning of a long-term process, uh, which is very good. I'd like to thank uh, the panelists on housing, Laila, Katerina, Wright, and uh, Soha. Thank you very much for your very interesting contributions and inputs. And now I will give the floor to Annalisa Boni, Secretary General of Eurocities, for the final remarks yeah. on the events of today and the future steps. If I understand, Katerina is leaving as well. So, do you, yeah, do you want, because we had foreseen, if you wanted, to give a final recommendation oh, on today. This, this was, was on only housing. That's, that's it. Okay, fine. I think you've given us uh, a lot of... Uh, food for thought, a lot of input. We thank you very much for that. And yes, today, I mean, we've heard a lot of interesting challenges, a lot of interesting and important issues, um, you know, um, ideas as well and so on. So the, the only thing, the only way I'd like to conclude this, uh, this, this morning is to say that's just the beginning, yeah? It's really just the beginning, stay tuned with us, with Eurocities. We will continue to work with the Commission, with the Parliament, with the partners uh, in the room, with the cities. I'm so proud to have seen so many cities, uh, you know, coming to Brussels to demonstrate their involvement, their engagement, their commitment, uh, so much on, on the social agenda, but in many other ways. So stay tuned. We will continue to stay committed on the pillar. We will continue to collect pledges uh, and yes, and, and make sure that the social agenda, as was said this morning, will be high on the EU agenda for the next uh, time round after the elections. And yes, that's it. I would like to thank everybody, thank the speakers, thank the cities, thank the audience for having been patient to go through this uh, tracking, interesting tracking. Uh, thank the Commission, the Parliament, and uh, a huge thank to the team which has uh, done so much work to make this event really successful. So, Silvia, Silvia, Bianca, Patricia, Alex, uh, Guillermo, Solène, uh, Salvo, and, and everyone that has contributed. So thank you very much, and bon appétit. <laughs> there is a little uh, lunch that we offer in the third floor just outside the room. So thank you, Wallis, too, for being there to the beginning to the end, from the beginning to the end.